morning and welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, March 28th. This proceeding is being broadcast on channel 35. The exact broadcast times can be found by contacting channel 35. Board of Water and Power Commissioners, please say present for roll call. Commissioner Katz. Present. Commissioner Lair. President McLean Hill. Present. Commissioner Neiman Brady. Vice President Ruiz. Present. Three board members, a quorum is present. Madam President. Uh, thank you. Um, and I do have a couple of opening remarks today. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge that a campaign started yesterday, a Blue Square campaign, a campaign that uh, seeks to elevate uh, and amplify the, uh, the despicable um, and uh, overwhelming amount of um, hate that is being directed at members of the Jewish community in this country. It's a campaign that uh, amplifies the fact that only 2%, 2.5% of US uh, residents are Jewish, and yet 55% of religious hate crimes are directed at that community. I think it's important that, uh, that none of us uh, face these challenges in isolation. And I just wanted to do my part and to have uh, this organization take a moment to think about how you become an ally, how you help stand against the kind of religious discrimination and bigotry that is uh, all too often being directed at members of our community, at our friends, at our neighbors, at our family members. Um, and just take a moment to acknowledge that that is going on today in the United States. On a different note, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that we are coming to the close of Women's History Month, a time to celebrate not only women's contribution to history and the culture, but to recognize the most fundamental journey of all, our inextricable march toward total agency and autonomy. It was in 1980 that President Jimmy Carter declared March 8th to be the first day of Women's History Week. Eight years later, Congress designated March as a month-long celebration. During the month of March, I am reminded of one of my favorite books written by Nicholas Kristof and Sherilyn Wundon, titled Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide. The book, written in 2009, advances the proposition that the oppression of women worldwide is the paramount moral challenge of our time. As much as the fight against slavery was in the past, and it is very difficult to contemplate the ongoing oppression of women, the brutal and unspeakable acts against women's bodies as a part of war and the subjugation of women across the globe without taking their point. The title comes from a Chinese proverb meaning women hold up half the sky. I could never imagine in 2009 that in 2023 we'd be debating in this country women's choices about their bodies. It is against that backdrop <laughs> that I am always so pleased to be part of the incredible sisterhood of women here at DWP. We come from every part of the globe and represent every faith, speak languages, uh, different uh, diversity of languages. We have a diversity of beliefs and talents. But what we share is a bond, a respect, a sisterhood, an encouragement that is just second to none. 
it is especially important, this is an especially important time to celebrate the undeniable role that women play in LADWP's history, then and now. Especially those who were trailblazers or are ahead of their time, those who broke the glass ceiling. The enthusiasm, the spirit, the, um, the grit of the women at DWP is on full display day after day after day, and for that I'm grateful. This past Saturday <laughs> was a particularly fun time uh, when hundreds of women showed up from this agency braving temperatures in the 40s <laughs> to stand together to celebrate one another and to walk around one of our many, many assets. Uh, thank you uh, for, I want to acknowledge that there will be a presentation from SWE here today. And I'm grateful and interested very much in um, seeing and hearing that presentation. And I appreciate the time this morning that I've been afforded to say a few things about um, both the campaign against hate and the incredible women of LADWP. Thank you. Are there any other remarks this morning? All right, then we will move on to um, general public comment. Public comment is now open. Good morning, speakers. Please be mindful that you will have two minutes to address the board. The first speaker is Mark Hoviter, who will be followed by Mark Riccio or Riccio. <coughs> Hello, I'm Mark Hoviter, Los Angeles Unified School District, the Chief of Facilities. I wanna thank this group. We've had an incredible partnership. I've been with the district over 20 years and almost all of it has been very pleasant between the two of us. But the things we've been able to accomplish 10, nine years ago, we committed to reducing our water consumption by 20% within the next 10 years. For us, that's two and a half billion gallons of water. So we were gonna reduce it by half a billion. We did it last year, so we might as well go to 25. Uh, we've been equally aggressive at trying to put water back into our, our stormwater systems. We have 75 different stormwater collection detention systems on 50 campuses, and we're, we're continuing to modernize our campuses. We'll do that on every one of our campuses. Uh, right now, we're collecting water from um, our sites only, but we're very optimistic that we're going to get to the point that water doesn't stop at the fence line. We should be able to do joint collections, and we think that's going to be better for everyone as we go. And we've been very aggressive with our electrical program and our reduction efforts similar to our water, but we're also uh, extremely committed to getting to 100% clean energy consumption by 2030. Um, to do that, we're partnering with you, and we're going to produce 70 megawatts of our own electricity. We've got 32 sites that are in contract stages right now that we're going to award soon. Um, we'll get between three quarters and a megawatt on each one of those, more if we're able to work out the feed-in tariff provisions. Uh, I'm here today to speak to item number 10. I think it's an important piece, a part of our program to get to our goals. Um, 2030, we're not done. We have to go on and get uh, everything that we consume is powered by energy that's clean energy which means no fossil fuels, all of our buses. We have 1,200 buses, every one of them are gonna be electric. Um, our buses, we think it provides great opportunity for continued partnership because we're gonna tr continue to charge our buses even in the summer when we don't need them because that's our, that's our storage batteries on wheels. And then we can feed those back into the system where people need them, where we're not necessarily consuming those. So anything that we can do with storage is gonna be great. It's the next plateau of where we're going. I see nothing but remarkable things and I, I thank this, this group and its uh, commissioners for everything that you've done to support us. And there's gonna be great things that will happen for LA and for our students, and thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say director of facilities? I am the chief of facilities chief for of Los Angeles High School District. No, I'm just, uh, we don't normally uh, get into a dialogue during uh, general comment or public comment, but you're here. Uh, so two things. A, I want to say uh, on behalf of a board member who's no longer here, uh, Jill Barrard, that she would be uh, extremely, uh, she, I, that she would want to highlight the work that you also do, um, supported by this department to advance um, conservation education. 
uh, with young people. I know that she was particularly fond of the buckets and there would never be a time when LAUSD came up when she did not reference the bucket. So on her behalf, I wanna make that point. And then on a second point, I just want to encourage uh, the district to think about all of the blacktop that it has on its campuses throughout the city. Um, as you, I am certain, know, uh, during extreme heat, some of the hottest places in Los Angeles are LAUSD schools in South LA or <clears throat> in the Valley. A great deal of progress could be made around uh, impacting or mitigating some of the impacts of extreme heat uh, were the district to rapidly uh, look at greening those blacktops and other um, other uh, interventions that uh, involve the planting of trees and other shade kinds of elements. And I am certain that that is something that we would love to discuss with you and to help facilitate. So while we're extremely proud of this program, or at least I'm extremely proud of this program, and plan to uh, vote for item 10, there is a great deal of work to do uh, in order to uh, make our community safe and LAUSD has a significant role to play. If I can make one comment on pavement, we're committed to reducing all our asphalt by 30%. Mm -hmm. Last night at our board, we had 30 projects that were approved. We're committed to spend over $90 million in the next two years to reduce asphalt, to put green, or brown, brown's the new green, decompose <laughs> granite. <laughs> and for the stuff that we do have to leave as pavement, we're gonna do cool coating on it, so it'll help the overall effect as well. Thank you, very good to hear, <laughs> appreciate it, sir. Yeah, can I chime in as well? Absolutely, like to, to you're second. here, what can we say? <laughs> I'd like to second um, the, the president's comments and I'm really glad to hear the initiative to reduce asphalt. I know there are many schools doing wonderful work, but I wanna call out Esperanza Elementary. Um, they've really done some incredible work on the, the access to nature side and really connecting children with uh, biodiversity that I think could be a model throughout the district. And I hope that some of that asphalt removal will focus on nature-based solutions and, and native plants and native biodiversity. Um, but I also just want to commend these overall efforts that the district has done because I recognize, um, you know, coming from higher education, the power that buildings and the built environment can have as a teaching tool and the way in which having solar on site or um, stormwater catchment on site can also in itself be a teaching tool for our children. So thank you very much for your leadership. One more comment, our, our asphalt <laughs> removal projects are not sure. asphalt removal projects, they're outdoor classroom projects. Excellent. It just happens that we're taking out asphalt to build the classrooms. I can only say that Commissioner Lair is not here today. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> as a landscape architect, you have yet another person to listen to before you can take your seat. So no, thank you so very yeah, much. And you. I look forward to learning more about the work at LAUSD. And we are very, very happy for the partnership. The next speaker is Mark Riccio, or Riccio, who will be followed by David Fink. Good morning, my name is Mark Riccio and I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Highland Electric Fleets. And I'd like to thank the board this morning for giving me the opportunity to support item number 10, which is the CES2G program here today. Uh, Highland has the most electric school buses under active contract in North America. Um, we provide a comprehensive <coughs> turnkey solution in the form of electrification as a service contract that delivers electric school buses, charging infrastructure, and supporting services to school districts. We have the largest active project really in the world in North America involving electric school buses with Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. We're implementing 326 electric school buses there. We also have one of the most successful vehicle to grid demand response programs in North America with Beverly Public Schools and National Grid, um, we've been able to discharge over two successful seasons about 10.8 megawatts of energy, leveraging electric school buses as distributed energy resources. If you take that amount of energy, that's enough to power about 200 homes in Massachusetts in a single day. And that program is only involved right now with two electric school buses. We're very supportive of LADWP's efforts in creating 
in crafting innovative non-stationary grid-connected <clears throat> energy storage programs like CES2G that expand community resilience and support innovative financing opportunities for fleets to electrify. Highland is currently deploying some of the first V2G school bus projects in the country. We're active now in 30 states and growing, and also in Canada. And we believe that this technology not only leads to future cost savings for school districts, but also enables electric school buses to operate as a community asset when, grid, when the grid is down, thereby enhancing community resilience. Programs like CES2G will create meaningful guardrails and assurances that are essential for our company to operate and develop vehicle to grid projects in LA County. I implore you to please ratify this today. We have a lot of projects pending. We do yellow electric school bus. We also do white fleet, which is municipal and commercial. And this program is going to really open a lot of doors and we make significant investments to put the steel in the ground and make everything right. Um, I'd like to thank you again for your time and the opportunity to speak with you all today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, my name is David Fink, and I'm the Sustainability Director at the Los Angeles Business Council. Uh, we're a business advocacy and research organization with over 500 members across greater Los Angeles. And on behalf of LABC, I'm here to speak in support of the proposed commercial energy storage to pilot program, which will help Los Angeles and California address our urgent energy reliability needs. The program will enable Los Angeles to address multiple challenges at once through harnessing the untapped battery storage capacity of mo mobile battery sources, such as buses and trucks, and by incentivizing stationary batteries. The electrification of transporta transportation creates a once in a generation opportunity for EVs to not only decarbonize transportation, but also <laughs> keep the lights on during power outages and improve local air quality. Both mobile battery sources and in-basin stationary battery storage can store abundant renewable energy when available and provide peak power when the grid needs it most. Widespread adoption of these untapped battery sources will help LADWP phase out fossil fuel powered backup generators and reduce reliance on polluting power plants, enabling us to reach our, reach our LA100 goals sooner, all while making the grid more resilient. LABC has dozens of renewable energy developers and property owners in our membership who currently participate in LADWP's FIT program and have waited for a standalone battery incentive program such as this to help grow the industry locally, create new jobs, and help the city meet our renewable energy goals. We hope that this program can be quickly scaled up and turned into a permanent program while incorporating lessons learned from the pilot since we need to expand our in-basin storage capacity urgently. For these reasons, the Los Angeles Business Council is excited to support the Commercial Energy Storage to Pilot Program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Public comment is now closed. All right, thank you so very much. Um, report from the general manager. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, begin with, we'll uh, keep with tradition. I'll first turn it over to Anselmo to uh, <laughs> give us the uh, uh, low down on what's going on with the storms and the aqueduct condition so he can uh, bring us up to speed. Mm -hmm. This report will be good till tomorrow when it rains again. So go ahead. <laughs> yes, so it, it keeps coming, commissioners. Uh, there's another storm that's supposed to be hitting Los Angeles uh, later today, tomorrow. And in the OS Valley, there is actually uh, uh, more snow coming uh, to the point that right now we sit around 285% of normal as of April 1st. So that just tells you the significant amount of water. Once we do our last uh, snow survey, we'll probably be able to confirm that this is more than likely the wettest year in history. I think we shared before that with the board that the wettest year in history was recorded in 1969. We believe that we have blown past that by quite a bit, as a matter of fact, which is great news from a perspective of water supply, but obviously that comes out of our price. Um, in LA, we actually got them 27 inches of snow, uh, of water, not snow, water. <laughs> that would be new, right? Uh, 27 inches of, of water, which is uh, uh, quite, a, quite a bit more than the average of 14 inches. Um, because of all the rain in LA, we've been able to capture a little over 100,000 acre feet of water 
with our stormwater capture program, which is the most amount of water we've ever captured uh, in, in, with storms. Uh, that's enough water for over 400,000 households to get water for an entire year. So this is pretty significant amount of water that we've been able to capture. Um, also because of all the precipitation we've seen in the state, the Department of Water Resources for the state of California just increased the allocation of the state water project to 75%. So it went from 35% like a month ago, they increased to 75%. Mm -hmm. And there's talk that it might even go above that. So that's pretty significant. Everybody's doing their part to basically move as much water as possible. I can tell you that uh, this past weekend, I had a chance to go to uh, Oroville and to take a look at that. And um, they were actually spilling 15,000 cubic feet per second of water through their spillway. So just imagine a cubic foot is like a, like a basketball. Imagine 15,000 basketballs every second passing by you. That's how much water they were actually releasing from the reservoir in preparation for the runoff because they went from being a very low elevation to over 80% in a matter of a couple of, a few weeks. So they're getting prepared the same way that the aqueduct staff is getting prepared. Uh, as you know, we have an item later on to discuss about the preparation for emergency. My staff and the department staff in general has been working really hard in getting, fixing the aqueduct, the portions that we have to fix, but also now preparing for the runoff that we know is gonna be coming in the spring. It, it takes a village <clears throat> definitely to get all this work done. So staff will be working really hard with our partners in getting the Owens Valley ready for the significant runoff we expect to get. That's it, thank you, Marty. And so I just did want to make a comment. I just want to acknowledge um, Adam Perez, the LA Aqueduct Director, for doing a fantastic job. I know it's a team effort, yes. but I just wanted to acknowledge his leadership. Thank you, Commissioner. I'll pass it along to, to Adam. He's been doing an absolute great job as the incident commander and also as the aqueduct manager. So him and his entire team are doing a great job. Um, yeah, I just wanna, well, I'll wait till the end. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a, do, a few slides uh, from Saturday's event. We had the Women's Power Walk, as uh, uh, our board president mentioned, and actually all of our board members were here. Uh, were there. We had a quorum. That's right. We had a quorum. So, <laughs> and yes, we did. So it was a great day uh, on Saturday. Uh, we were lucky at clear skies. Uh, as you'd said, Madam President, it was cold and about 25 mile an hour wind coming off the water. So that made it uh, an experience to remember. But it was a beautiful day out there. Uh, a, a lot of employees and their family members showed up. Um, it was great to see LA Reservoir. It's the home of the 96 million shade balls that are pretty world famous. Um, and uh, a lot of our key facilities in the, in the water system and also some key facilities that we house for other city agencies. Um, we were fortunate to have a, a, a lot of folks that supported this. Uh, water and Power Credit Union uh, was there to partner with us uh, by providing uh, you know snacks and help with uh, raffle items that we gave away. Uh, the event was sponsored by our Women's Council here as well as uh, our SWE organization. Uh, and staff members from corporate safety, corporate strategy and communications, water operations, security services, uh, human resources, uh, DEI, and the board office were all uh, all took part in organizing this event. So it's become our second annual event, and uh, we we might have to find an in between time to do it. Not have to wait a whole another year for something. Maybe we can have an in between uh, <laughs> women's power walk. But it was uh, it's a great chance also for our employees uh, to not only get out and be together, but also you know see some key things they may not get to see all the time. Uh, other good events coming up, we have uh, this Saturday is our uh, Chatsworth Earth Day open house. Uh, everybody always says it's not actually Earth Day on Saturday. We always do it on a different day <laughs> than Earth Day. Um, so that'll be on Saturday. That is open to the public. Um, we'll be uh, we'll begin uh, uh, with a blessing by the Fernandino uh, Tatavian Band of uh, Mission Indians. There'll be guided nature hikes. There's storytelling. There's uh, quite a few probably two dozen or more exhibitors with, with animal and other exhibits and environmental exhibits. Uh, quite a community event. This is open to the public. Uh, we typically get about 2,000 people there, uh, but Chatsworth is so large, it looks like it's hardly occupied. So it's a great a great time to be outside, and this year ought to be something else. Uh, the Ecology Pond should be full of water. Um, everything should be growing and blooming. Should be a lot of wildlife out there in addition to the exhibit. So, we encourage uh, everyone uh, who's interested to come join us. There's information at ladwp.com. 
uh, backslash CNP, that stands for Chatsworth Nature Preserve Earth Day. So there's information there on that event as well. So we hope to get a good turnout from the public. Um, last week we had the uh, uh, Canadian Water Road Show. This is something we started back in 2016 uh, with, uh, with uh, in con uh, conjunction with the Canadian consulate locally to bring uh, technologies and businesses that might have uh, uh, ideas for us uh, into the water area. Uh, we actually one year did a, a water and power combined road show. It's an in issue where we actually identify what our needs are. The Canadian consulate identifies companies uh, that might have products or services that would help us. And so uh, over the course of time, we've actually engaged with a number of companies uh, through this effort. And so it's been a great chance to talk about our challenges and as part of our international effort to really spread ourselves to find out what technologies are available, not just locally, but also around the world so that we're not reinventing the wheel and always trying to access our, our, ourselves to uh, the best technologies and solutions that are out there. So that, that was another good success this last week. Our Easy Safe program uh, continues with the success. We had a decline during COVID of enrollment. We saw a 25% increase at the end of 2022, and we're now at an all-time high of 150,000 uh, uh, customers participating in the Easy Safe program. And this is the roll-up of our programs for uh, for low-income and disadvantaged customers. Um, so we have another campaign coming up uh, in 2023. Actually, a couple campaigns in 2023 to increase enrollment. But uh, we've really uh, reached out to every media venue, uh, every type of advertisement, uh, working both with customer service, uh, corporate strategy, communications, and DEI to really try to reach as many customers mm -hmm. who are eligible as possible so we can help as many people as possible. I've seen a great campaign on social media. Yeah, thank you. It's been, uh, Joe Romalo's run a strong campaign and, it's, and, and we've seen it's made a difference. It, it a huge uptick in, in, in recent, last couple months. Um, we also participated March 12th, 10th to the 12th in the uh, Abilities Expo. It was uh, put on by the city's Department of Disability uh, at the convention center. And they had about 7,000 attendees, about a 40% increase from the previous year, uh, primarily uh, people with disabilities. And uh, our folks were there, particularly customer service folks and people from our service centers uh, to, uh, to help people understand the, the uh, different products and, and uh, programs that we have available to them to help them in their life and to help them financially uh, with their water and power bills. And so we participated in that and had a great success and employees had a lot of satisfaction from, from taking part in that as well. So lastly, I want to turn it over to Aaron. We've got a couple of personnel announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Commissioners. I have a couple of announcements on the appointments of uh, the head of interim head of the security services and the uh, the supply chain uh, director. So on March 3rd, Arnold Esquita was appointed as interim director of security services division. Arnold brings uh, over 30 years of experience in the security um, services organization. Him and I go way back. We've been on projects together. I've known him personally, and I'm very pleased that he took the interim role um, as we prepare for uh, the permanent uh, uh, assignment of that, that position. <laughs> Also yesterday, Edith Williams uh, was officially appointed as the Director of Supply Chain Services. Uh, the same, Edith and I go way back. We've been working together. She brings a, a wealth of information and experience to this um, uh, division. She has a bachelor's and a master's degree in public administration from Cal State LA. And uh, she's been involved in major deployment of uh, systems in the supply chain. She's been involved in major contracts. She's managed that place for a long time and she brings a huge uh, depth of leadership and, uh, and experience to that. Uh, so I just wanna welcome both of them. If they're here, if they can uh, stand up and just be recognized and uh, thank you for accepting the position. And this is any questions that concludes my report. Um, I just have a couple of comments. Um, first, with respect to the uh, report from Water Systems, um, it is clear that we have dodged uh, the proverbial bullet uh, with respect to all of the rain that uh, has, has come uh, to California over the last few months. <clears throat> but I do want to um, make sure that uh, we're prepared uh, uh, for the reality of our future. And so I am going to uh, want to see a pretty comprehensive uh, briefing to the board on the, um, on the progress of Operation Next. 
on any challenges associated with the deployment of Operation Next. Um, and um, I, um, I'm concerned about what we face in the next few weeks and months as snow begins to melt. Mm -hmm. Um, and want to make sure that we are as um, proactive as we can be, not just in terms of the work that we're doing, but also in terms of preparing the public. Um, sometimes, you know, it's just we can't stop the water <laughs> um, <laughs> and the potential for damage uh, or flooding um, or you know, other unforeseen, um, or let's not, I won't say unforeseen, other um, uh, eventualities that could be problematic. Uh, we, you know, we are conditioned to provide good news <laughs> and to, uh, and to celebrate our wins. But as you said, those wins are coming at a significant cost. And we need to be very proactive and very fulsome about what it's taking to manage this very unusual occurrence or this new occurrence. It may become more standard than not. And we need to think about that as well. But also, we want to make sure, I mean, we've seen uh, you know, in other areas some pretty dramatic and, and, and deadly uh, flooding. And we want to make sure that we are in front of the ball as it relates to any potential flooding, um, as it relates to any damage that may be done as we move this water mm -hmm. around, mm -hmm. uh, and that we're clear about the potential choices that we may be facing. Um, you know, it's, it's much better on the front end mm -hmm. to have people understand what could happen because not only can we prepare, but they can prepare uh, than it is to report on the back end um, how well we've done or what we've had to sacrifice in achieving our objectives. So, um, you know, very uh, great news that it's raining. <laughs> if only it would spread out a little bit, but great news. <laughs> and really great news that, um, you know, that things are filling up and that that will get us through for a little bit. But now's the time to prepare, and to prepare in earnest for what we know the long-term implications of climate change are for this region, and also to really uh, not only give the best case, but the worst case assessment of what happens if that snow starts to melt okay. and melt fast. Okay. Commissioner, just if you don't mind, um, absolutely agree 100% what you just said. When it comes to uh, preparing and making sure the public is aware, you know, DWP, as part of the community up in Owens Valley, we participate in the regional coordination. So the county, uh, our offices are there, sheriff department. We work with them really closely uh, to make sure that as we see the start, the water start moving, that we keep the public informed. You're 100% right that there's been a lot of flooding in different areas, caused a lot of damage. And we want to make sure that we protect not just the aqueduct, but the people that live in these communities, many of whom happen to be department employees as well. So um, uh, your message is well received. We'll continue to work on that. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation with Joe Romalo a couple of weeks ago about having one of his uh, staff members spend more time up in Owens Valley helping with the communication part of it as well. So uh, we, like you said, we need to make sure that we can let people know uh, we have plans in place but I think it's good to always remind people, you sometimes forget about the hazards until you see a problem. And at that point, it's too late. So um, I appreciate the comments, and we will certainly provide you with a briefing on Operation Next and where we are and the challenges. And also, we can talk about what we're doing to prepare for the future, where it's going to be more rain than snow. And we're going to be getting it at times when we don't necessarily need the rain uh, and what to do with it. So that's certainly part of uh, what the entire state needs to do from a water management perspective. Thank All you. right, thank you. And then with respect to uh, the women's uh, uh, walk, I just want to acknowledge uh, the um, really exemplary work by fleet services <laughs> and by uh, security services, all of whom were out there a whole lot earlier than us <laughs> and who were joyful 
in their support of the event. And I think that I, uh, in addition to saluting the women of this department, I do want to acknowledge all of the men that support the goals and the ambitions of the women here. So thank you uh, to both those, uh, both those divisions. Um, and with that, I think we can move on. Um, I'm unaware of any motions for future consideration. Uh, comments from Ratepayer Advocate on agendized item, sir? Yes. Uh, we have a specific report in the agenda on item 10, which offers our support for that item with some guide rails. Uh, the, uh, then why don't we do this? We'll call item 10 special. Okay. And you can provide your report at that time. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Uh, there are a number of items dealing with pay, uh, benefits on today's agenda. Uh, we have completed a uh, total compensation benchmarking effort based on calendar year 2019, and it looked at the benefits as part of the overall, overall compensation package, and we believe them to be reasonable. Thank you, sir. That, that isn't specific to these contracts, but to all the benefits taken as a package. Uh, thank you, sir. Excellent. Appreciate that. Um, then we can, uh, any anything from neighborhood council representatives? No community impact statements or formal positions were filed by any neighborhood councils on any of the items on today's agenda. Terrific. Then we are calling special items 9 and 10. Uh, other than that, uh, if we could have a motion. Uh, I would like to entertain it at this time. So moved. Uh, Second. So a motion will need to identify, so it would be for items 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11. Um, Commissioner Sorry. Ruiz cannot vote on um, item 11. Ah, got okay. it. So we will go a motion for items 1 through 8. Uh, second. Uh, so I've moved. It's been seconded by Commissioner um, Katz. Uh, if we could uh, call the roll, please. Commissioner Katz? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes, motion adopted. Uh, terrific, thank you. Uh, I assume that it takes three votes to pass an item. Therefore, we're deferring item 11. Is that correct? It does. Here. Okay, thank present. you. So we'll be deferring item 11, and we'll come back to 9 and 10. And we will move now to management reports, beginning with presentation number one from the Society of Women Engineers. Yes, I'd like to introduce uh, Rosalba Santana and Anna Avalar, who will present from the LA DWP chapter of Society of Women Engineers. Uh, this month marks their uh, fifth anniversary yeah. since the group was the chapter was started here at DWP. So it's been that long. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Commissioners. I'm Rosalba Santana, Civil Engineering Associate in Water Distribution and current president of the LADWP Society of Women Engineers Affiliate Group. I'm here with Anna Avalar, who is the SWE Vice President representing the water system. We are here to do our annual report. Blanca Herrera, our Vice President uh, representing Power, could not be here today. She's on maternity leave awaiting the arrival of her baby girl. However, she's listening and we want to acknowledge her for helping us prepare for this presentation. We are very pleased to be here today to report to you on the achievements and the progress of the organization as we celebrate Women's History Month and the fifth year anniversary of the organization. LADWP's 
SWE mission is to provide members with support to accomplish their full potential. We strive to promote women in STEM, engineering, and all other fields. And through our efforts, intend to mitigate the gender disparities and help build a more diverse and inclusive workforce. The Society of Women Engineers was founded on March of 2018. I want to highlight that SWE is the first professional resource group here founded at the department. The leadership and the vision of five extraordinary women and the firm support of 100 charter members are the reason why we stand here today before you. I wanna thank these women for creating, a, for creating an organization that empowers us, helps us connect and learn from each other. Their efforts are an invaluable contribution to the department. I also want to thank the LEDWP's executive leadership for their support at the inception and throughout. We wouldn't be able to continue to serve our members and the community if it wasn't for the patronage of the board, the DEI office, and the executive leadership of the different systems. Suite today is 249 members strong. It is comprised of 131 members from the water system, 90 members from the power system, and 37 members from the joint system. Our membership, our membership represents multiple work classifications, and I also wanna acknowledge that we have 71 male members, uh, and I wanna thank them for being our allies and supporters to the cost. And actually, many of them are executive leaders in the different uh, systems of the department. Good, good morning, commissioners. My name is Anna Avalar. I am a civil engineering associate in the Water Engineering and Technical Services Division, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you our current board of directors. These ladies have volunteered their free time, often giving up many of their lunches and even some evenings to help SWE put together the events that we do for our members. Rosalva Santana is our current president and my co-presenter today. Leah Mulat is our past president, um, and we want to thank her for all the continued guidance that she has provided for us. The third photo there is myself. I am the current VP for the water system. And Blanca Herrera uh, is the current VP for the power <coughs> system. And we want to wish her the best as, as she awaits the arrival of her baby girl. Uh, Fabiola Perez is our secretary. Elise Pruet is our treasurer. Ashley Hogan is our operations chair. Alex Heronilla and Noemi Rangel oversee education. Cynthia Codeverdian and Tatiana Lerma are our membership chairs. Clarice Perasinge and Tanya Chavez oversee communications. Irma Lissama Kumar and Julianne Berg are our outreach chairs. Chloe Garios and Ani Sarkisian are our social chairs. And I wanna recognize the group sitting behind me to the left um, and just give them a special shout out. Without all of these ladies, SWE could not uh, put together the events that we do for our members. So they deserve a special recognition. I also wanna highlight Julianne Berg who works out of Bishop. She has stepped up to help SWE expand our, um, our presence up north, and she has helped us recruit additional members from the Bishop area. And she also has taken the initiative to uh, help put together events up north that mirror the events that we're uh, holding down south in here. So thank you all. I also want to thank our executive advisors, Nermina Rusik O'Neill and Heidi Hirioka. They serve as our management advocates, and without their continued support and guidance, we would not be uh, where we are today. SWE's mission is sustained on three foundational pillars, support, transform, and recruitment. We support our membership by providing them with educational opportunities for professional and personal development, membership, and interview preparation for career advancement. Also, SWE is strongly invested in outreach, which we believe will help narrow the gap representation of women and minorities in engineering and STEM. On a regular basis, our members volunteer uh, to do outreach activities at local schools, for students in K through 12. We're also very proud to share that we are partnering with GALA, which is an all girls public school that focuses on STEM. The partnership is quite fitting for 
our values and what we believe in. And we are very excited to help mentor, give exposure and spark interest to these young ladies and uh, hopefully have them pursue engineering and STEM careers in the future. Thirdly, Sweet partners with recruitment to bring intelligent professional female engineers to the department. We assist recruitment efforts at our national and local conferences, also by attending events at universities and career fairs. The new board of directors was selected in July of last year and we've hit the ground running, um, adapting to our current hybrid work environment. We put together educational presentations. Uh, we selected three of the uh, SUI National 2022 presentations to broadcast to all of our members as we could not send them all to Houston. After a long hiatus, we put together <coughs> in-person events to help our, our members interact with each other socially. Our members appreciation lunch was in early December 2022 here at JFB. In terms of professional re development, we've partnered with the recruitment office to help staff our uh, booth at the 2022 <laughs> National Conference in Houston, <laughs> Texas. You can find Rosalba and I and a few other of our board members in the uh, photo over on the right-hand side in the, towards the middle. Um, and this year, we've encouraged <laughs> all of our members to submit abstracts to be potentially selected as speakers at the 2023 National Conference, which will take place here in Los Angeles. We've submitted a total of 17 abstracts for consideration. And lastly, through our partnership with Gala, we've helped coordinate two field trips for their students so far. The photo on the top right hand side of the screen is at the filtration plant with 55 seniors from uh, Gala's AP Environmental Science class and our very own outreach chair, Irma Lissama Kumar, standing in the front row left. In January 2023, we launched our full-scale mentoring program. I want to highlight the mentors you see on screen there. Aside from their day-to-day -day obligations and their supervisory responsibilities, they've stepped up to volunteer at a minimum one hour of their time each month. The program will have a one-year duration, and each month, the mentees will initiate a meeting with their mentors and bring up the topics for uh, that month. The mentors will listen to the mentees and help advise and provide lessons learned throughout their career. So last October, we attended the SWE National Conference in Houston. Participation at the SWE Conference is really something unique. It's very special to see 16,000 women gather in one place for STEM and engineering. It really fills us with hope. During the conference, we conducted recruitment, SWE member staff LADWP's recruitment booth. We gave information to interested candidates. Uh, we also conducted on-site interviews over the two-day duration of the career fair, and we estimate that about 300 conference attendees stopped at our booth. The conference provided also members of, um, that attended with a platform to network with other professionals in the field, also attend workshops to enhance their skills, gain inspiration for their own work, and the opportunity to exchange ideas with peers and also hear from keynote speakers on uh, leadership advice. Participation at the conference also gave the department the opportunity to build brand awareness amongst the participants. Um, we were there side by side with top employers who are hiring STEM and engineering professionals. Also, I'm very proud to share that at the SWEET conference, we had two of two speakers, our own Evelyn Cortez Davis and our past uh, president, Leah Mulat. Um, Evelyn's session was a creative take on leadership lessons from women in Star Wars, and Leah's <laughs> session <laughs> focused on transforming what could be perceived as a negative into a, a strength based on her personal experience as a triple minority. I want to emphasize that both sessions were a hit. Uh, we had attendees come to our booth uh, because they wanted to get autographs from Evelyn. It was <laughs> quite amazing. This year... <laughs> This year, as Anna mentioned earlier, we conducted informational sessions and workshops to motivate our members to submit abstracts, and we're looking forward to the selection and, and seeing them as speakers at the conference. So this year, 
Suite 23 National Conference is happening here at the LA Convention Center. It will be October 26th through the 28th. And we have a very unique opportunity. Uh, SWE is strongly committed to have a strong presence there. This year's, this year's theme is Live Without Limits. And we certainly want to showcase LADWP and attract talent to live their career at LADWP with, without limits. We're actively planning our participation at the conference. We're working closely with recruitment and public communications on the design of our recruitment booth. We also want to host a hospitality suite that it's going to provide in interested conference participants with information, the opportunity to talk to our female leaders and learn what it is to work here at the department. We're also in the process of submitting applications to be considered uh, for uh, to host tours if selected. This is going to provide an opportunity to highlight the unique and exciting work that it's happening both in water and power. Um, we also wanna assure that our members have an opportunity to attend and get the benefits of the conference. So we're working on a sponsorship to pay for their registrations. In addition, we're looking to sponsor gala students to attend the conference on Saturday. Um, this day is focused on activities um, that it's geared to, to high school students and we wanna be able to provide that to the girls. Lastly, we're exploring sponsorship opportunities that are gonna give the department brand visibility and help familiarize and attract potential recruits. I'm excited that I get to tell you about what we have in store for the future. We aim to continue our professional development through uh, our continued WebEx series, and we're currently exploring in-person uh, events at various locations. We're planning on instituting a peer networking program where current members would be paired with members uh, in a similar stage of their career, with the goal of exposing um, our members to other potential career paths here within the department. We plan to part continue participating in the future Green Leader Summit Expo, which took place uh, just a few weeks ago on March 15th. We had a great turnout, and I want to thank the uh, volunteers from the power system who helped staff our booth. Um, as Rosalba touched upon, uh, we're partnering with GALA, and we hope to establish a sweet next chapter for the high school students um, could benefit from. We plan on also hosting a science day for employees' children to get the seed of STEM planted in their minds so they could uh, potentially pursue a career in STEM in the future. And we're currently working with our recruitment office to help put together a video that, which will showcase all the amazing work that our, that our members currently contribute towards. We hope to expand the number of LADWP SWE members here at JFB and at all the other locations and we're committed to having a strong presence at the upcoming national and at local conferences to support efforts from the recruitment office and to bring in the best talent from the industry to work here at the department with us. Well, honorable board members, it was a pleasure to present to you today. And before we depart, we also wanna show your appreciation to your leadership uh, by making you honorary members of the Society of Women Engineers. We feel inspired and uplifted to have a, a five-woman uh, board of commissioners. Your leadership serves the entire department, but more importantly, the woman in the department. By virtue of being a woman, you have a greater understanding for the challenges that women face in the workplace, and you have the opportunity to implement policies to remove those barriers. Please accept your honorary nomination as a symbol of our partnership in your initiatives of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you very much. I just want to say that was a fabulous presentation. <laughs> you know, I know how hard you guys work, and this is volunteer work. And I, I was happy to see that on your mentors, you had a lot of men too. So, you know, when you have a woman's organization, yes, it's to support women. But I think that, you know, I'm happy to see that men are involved as well. So, you know, I just want to thank the team. I want to thank your founders and, you know, keep up the good work. That was marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I would just echo that fantastic presentation and amazing work. Um, 
I was at that Future Green Leaders Summit with a different hat on and um, really inspiring to see the next generation of 1,800 middle schoolers from LAUSD um, getting inspired by, by your team and others who were there. So um, yeah, thank you for everything you do. And it would of course be an honor to, to join as an honorary member. So um, really appreciate, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I too want to say thank you for your work, but also to um, acknowledge the role that the department has in continuing to support and aligning our efforts with the opportunities that are identified by our employees. I think that the uh, upcoming national conference provides an enormous opportunity for the department to both, um, you know, uh, amplify its role in the industry and its brand and to uh, to recruit, to expand our recruiting opportunities. I mean, the, the um, unfortunate uh, you know, reality is that we are seriously underrepresented here at DWP in terms of women. And um, you know, to the extent that we have these incredibly talented employees with enormous responsibility in their like day job, taking on the added um, burden or the added um, opportunity of sharing, promoting, reaching out, partnering. Uh, we want to make sure that we are backing them up and partnering with them. Um, I you know, would hope to see a very strong representation of this department uh, at the conference uh, in Los Angeles. It's right down the street, so no big travel involved. Um, and certainly uh, hospitality seems to make sense. I also want to commend you for your uh, reaching out to Gala. Uh, to the, to, for those of you who were at their luncheon uh, or breakfast last week, um, you know, it's really remarkable to see so many empowered, uh, you know, uh, young girls pursuing educations in STEM, and they do represent uh, both the promise and the opportunity that we have to see a world be different, uh, you know, 20 years from now than the world that we inhabited. I'm reminded of my, um, my mother-in-law, who's 96 years old, was a PhD in mathematics. Wow. And, you know, when people seem impressed by that, she laments that when she was uh, an undergraduate, women were discouraged from getting PhDs in chemistry which is mm -hmm. what she actually wanted to pursue. So the march toward um, equity and the march toward full participation of women in these professions has been going on for a very long time and you are all tremendous standard bearers. So uh, I again look forward to seeing how uh, effective uh, we are as a department in making sure that the tools and the access to resources and the support that is needed to, um, to accelerate the work that's being done by the women of this department is uh, in place and, um, and to see the results. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, we will move to our next uh, presentation or next report <coughs> from the Office of Corporate Health and Safety. So uh, Nazir Fazli, who's our Director of Corporate Health and Safety, will present us with this team. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, thank sure. you for this opportunity to allow us to present a, co a corporate uh, health and safety report today. My name is Nazir Fazli, Chief Safety Officer, and with me today uh, we have Mark Hendon. Uh, Mark is a risk manager, manager of corporate safety, and Dan Ashelman, and he is uh, Assistant Director of Corporate Health and Safety. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Office of Corporate Health and Safety was established when corporate safety along with occupational health services and workers' compensation were moved under the uh, umbrella, under one organizational umbrella in, in November of 2021. 
Currently, uh, Office of Corporate Health and Safety is comprised of uh, corporate safety, uh, occupational health services, system safety, workers' compensation, and, and resource office. Uh, today's presentation, we will cover uh, the close coordination and collaboration of these groups uh, towards improving uh, DWP uh, safety performance, safety culture, reducing injury rates, and taking care of our injured employees and when injuries occur on the job and assisting them to return back to work as safely and as quickly as possible. With that, I will turn it over to Mark and I will be available for any questions that you may have. Mark? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to present Corporate Health and Safety's initiatives and we really appreciate the board's support. So to start off with corporate health and safety, we are comprised of a dedicated team of safety engineers, industrial hygienists, and administrative staff. And we take an enterprise-wide perspective um, in our anticipation, evaluation, and control of operational risks in the company. And everything that you see here on this list can be organizationally <coughs> structured within three key focus areas. One is training and field operations, two is policies and programs, and three would be audits and regulatory compliance. So number one, going back to training and field operations, you can see here that we provide in-house training and vendor provided training. We adapt to the needs of our operational providers, uh, partners by providing a mix of in-person, remote delivered, and computer-based training. Our fall protection and laboratory analytical services support key department initiatives, including our community solar program, home energy improvement, and routine outages. Normally around this time of year, we would be supporting water filtrations plant outage. Um, we support both our construction crews and our water team members in the delivery of fall protection services, confined entry, confined space entry, air monitoring, and hazardous material assessments. Second, the policies and programs. We are the custodian of the department's injury and illness prevention program. We manage its vehicle liability program and our safety management system initiative. Where we can, we embed these programs into existing <coughs> operational processes and company initiatives. For example, our safety management system is being built into the department's enterprise resource plan. Our contractor safety program is now a fixture the supply chain procurement processes. And number three, the audits and regulatory compliance. We represent the department during enforcement agency investigations and appeals, including Cal OSHA, the local public health departments, and the air quality management districts. And a key uh, goal of this team is to be proactive in our inspections and our audits of operational practices. So you see here in this list that we respond to accident investigations and OSHA complaints. But ideally we are proactive, you know, not merely responding reactively to an incident or an investigation of an, a past event. To that end, it's important that we maintain key partnerships with our division safety and our operational par partners um, that provide similar services. Here I'd like to focus on an eye for the future. What I mean by that is everything that you see here, um, whether it's categorized as safety engineering or industrial hygiene, is an integral component of emerging issues, projects and initiatives, whether it be evolving infrastructure, expanding energy conservation efforts, or new regulatory standards. On the safety side, a key emphasis for us is safety by design. In many cases, fall protection services, confined space entry risks can be mitigated early on in the de design phase of our projects. We are working with our engineering, <coughs> fleet, and procurement partners to ensure design standards are proactively um, anticipated. Those, uh, those risks are proactively anticipated before we overly invest in a direction that becomes difficult to retreat from. So we recognize that there are pockets of areas in the department that are great at this, but our goal is to adopt these practices on an enterprise, that are enterprise in scope. Uh, we see opportunity to engineer out many of our risks before exposing our employees um, unnecessarily. 
On the regulatory front, I would like to um, echo the concern, Madam Commissioner, that you stated about water and the, the snow and what, the, what has, was frozen then melts and what melts then dries. And so we are, uh, you know, while we celebrate the much needed rain that we've recently experienced, we are keenly aware of its potential impact in the coming years when it dries. To, today's rain is tomorrow's potential fuel for wildfires. There are um, stringent wildfire protection standards that are in place that we need to prepare for now. It's not something that um, we can mobilize in an instant. We need to prepare now. So with that, towards that end, we need to expand our efforts to monitor air quality indices, uh, training for our field crews, respiratory protection, and potential need to include um, employees in medical surveillance in the future. So you so, say we need to do this. Are we doing this? We are doing it, but we need to expand. So we see. Yeah, I, because I was going to, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, you, your, your team has, um, over the course of the last, uh, I guess maybe two years now since we've been engaged in this dialogue, has been putting forward um, increasingly sophisticated and substantive, um, very you know, well thought out measures to enhance corporate safety. Um, and I very much appreciate that. My only, you know, my real question um, goes to how rapidly we're actually bringing these things to scale. Yes. Um, because, uh, you know, I know how easy it is to get involved in the doing of the work uh, and the crush of, of challenges that we face, whether it's you know storms or the need to replace aging infrastructure or um, you know the myriad of things that that we confront, um, and sometimes that translates into risk mitigation taking a back seat. So I'm very interested in understanding the degree to which we are not only identifying what we should be doing, but putting those things to practice and driving them through the organization in a way that they are being rigorously attended to. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. So yes, we have elements of each, we have practices in place that meet the elements that I just outlined, but to your point, it is scale. Scale is the key, there is um, work for us to do to improve to expand and to, um, again, be proactive in that growth effort to make sure that this is not something that we are trying to mobilize as the wildfire occurs or we're in the season of wildfire. We need to be proactive and do it early on. So um, expanding our measures to monitor the air quality. There's also um, efforts in Cal OSHA to expand let me ask the question standards. differently. What is our current, like, at, how are we doing this work? How are we expanding this work? Mm -hmm. And in what, what is our time frame? Um, you did make the, and I heard the observation that there are pockets within the department where this kind of, you know, these practices, you know, exist and seem to be rather routine, but there's work to be done elsewhere. So can you give me a sense of, and if not you, Marty or Aram, a sense of where we are in terms of embracing and expanding the work that corporate safety is moving forward? And I say this, you know, with the realization that we have had two significant accidents in the span of, you know, over the course, uh, over a three-week period. I mean, significant accidents, either one of which could have resulted in the death of an employee. And it is simply not acceptable to, um, after the fact, be, you know, looking at what we could have done or should have done. And it's difficult for me to imagine that two accidents in a very short period of time is not indicative of some shortcoming. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can comment. I, I, I think 
I think the conversation is how we how do we mature our programs? So the responsibility of making sure that these programs have consistent training, consistent procedures, and consistent reporting is what we are after. So the this group, the corporate safety, is is the core of our philosophy and what we believe in. And how do we expand these principles across the organization and keep consistency is something that we, we are changing organizationally as far as the alignment goes. So the, the, the two large systems, water, water and, and power systems, are getting more and more aligned in, in those. But there's a whole big uh, group of uh, corporate uh, functions that we also have to address. So whether it's fleet, um, building uh, maintenance and, and, and other support services, supply chain, uh, the, the statistics are, are kind of counterintuitive because the groups that are, um, that you would think that the injury rates are, should be low, but they're high because of some sort of a shortfall that we have. So Nazir and I, Nazir sits right next to me every morning, we have these conversations about how can we close the gap and we need to move forward. But your comments is one injury is one injury too much, and and our philosophy is zero injury and zero uh, if, uh, near misses that we could injure employees. I mean that's the that's the goal that we have to reach, and then we have work to do, as as Mark mentioned. We do yes, we are hiring too for this very effort as well. Um, we do have much of the infrastructure in place, such as the training, the, the ability to provide. So what you all know <laughs> is that I'm going to transition very quickly from a conversation about philosophy and intention to one about timetables and metrics that we can use to be assured that this work is taking place. So if it is staffing, you know, I'm going to want to know what a full staffing plan looks like so I'll know if we're making progress getting there and by when. Um, you know, to the extent that there are organizational metrics that we are seeking to reduce, then we need to start benchmarking those things so that we can understand them. And on ARM, I'm, I'm happy that you, um, you know, that you mentioned other areas of the department outside of the things that sometimes jump out at us and seem most obvious. I'm also reminded that we have had uh, security officers uh, indicate concern about their personal safety and the execution of their jobs due to lack of adequate equipment. Um, I am curious about um, how we are addressing um, any modifications needed to support women who are working in the field um, because, you know, typically when we are thinking about equipment and things are being procured or built, you know, the standard prototype is male. And as we are moving more women into these jobs, we need to be mindful of what it takes for uh, them to do their work. And frankly, we have heard in conversations with women that they're kind of on their own to think about these issues and to kind of jerry-rig solutions. So, um, I know I've jumped into the middle of the of the presentation, and as I say, your presentations are universally stellar in terms of identifying what best practices look like, and there's always clearly a lot of rigor that has gone into thinking through what our organization should be doing. But in an organization where we consistently say that worker safety is a is is a priority for us, we've got to do more than say. We got to do. And I am interested in seeing um, in a very clear way what we are doing to close the gap between where we know we should be and where we are and how urgently we are moving toward closing that gap as we continue to put people uh, in harm's way in terms of the work that they're called upon to do. Absolutely. Agreed. Thank you. Some of the topics that you brought up there are in this presentation today, so we'll okay. get more I will let you go. Um, into it. So speaking of uh, metrics, um, our injury and illness metrics, what you see here 
in this slide right here, this is uh, workers' comp payouts by claim year. So all of these uh, bars right here on this bar graph all represent payouts in 2022. So it follows the life cycle of the claim. So what you see in 2018, for example, the incident occurred in 2018, but we paid this year. So in 2022, we paid roughly a little over 20 million in workers' compensation claims. So the 5 million in 2022 is roughly just a quarter of the payments uh, for our claims filed uh, for what we paid out. So we ma manage a whole host of uh, metrics, including our annual 300 logs, our 5020 forms, serious injuries and fatalities, that we look at trends. Um, the payouts in 2022 is roughly about $2 million less than 2021. Um, but that being said, um, our goal is to expand. These are reactive numbers. Our, our goal is to shift that focus. And that is the spirit of our safety management system platform. Um, we have a, a contract that will be presented for board approval in the coming months and will provide the infrastructure to be able to capture some of these proactive measures so that we're not just presenting reactive numbers in terms of costs. So Mark, I do have rates. questions on this one because I did review this ahead of time and I misread this chart because I interpreted this is that we, if you look at the, the graphs, the bars going up, it looked like we were spending more money on workers' comp now versus that we did in 2018. So, and you're saying that's not the case, that we're getting better. So explain this chart to me because I totally misread it. Okay, I apologize. So in 2018, for example, there's an incident that occurred in 2018 that the payments are ongoing to this day. So in 2022, we paid out a little more than $900,000 for claims for incidents that occurred in 2018. So that dollar amount right there, that represents represents a payout in 2022. Okay, so what it, so 5 million, 5.1 million in 2022, what does that number mean? So those are payouts for <clears throat> incidents that happened in the year 2022. So, so that, it, so that so, looks so, like it's higher. Yeah, yeah so, so this so, graph so would probably correct. be similar each year. So every year the payouts, because we deal with this as well in our organization, every year you're going to end up with payouts that are related to the current year, and then you may also have some from prior years. And the prior years are always going to be smaller, but that's not necessarily indicative of where the injuries are going. And so I think for future presentations it might be helpful to have like OSHA-related incidents by year so you can give us that visual of how the incidents are shifting or the total payouts associated with that year, um, just because I do I do see why this would be a confusing image. Okay, very, yes, we do track that. We do have the, our incidents, our injury rates, days away, restrictions, transfers, um, injuries. We also have metrics for our vehicle liability. So is that number, or the in, no, yeah, number I was gonna say, so, so are we doing better or there worse? Is that number gone. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not nice pictures and pretty presentations, but tell us. Right, in terms of the payouts, the number is a little, this, uh, in 2022, it's a little bit lower compared to 2021. So we have to keep watching that trend to see if that was, did we have an off year or, or a good year or is, uh, so is 2023 gonna be a better year or is it uh, gonna be decreasing? So we What will... was the sort of trend prior to 2022? Was this increasing and this is the first dip or have we been yes. able to reduce over time? For the most part, it's been steady. It's the same thing with our injury rates. Um, we don't see a lot of variation. We do see that there are, uh, by division, when we break down by division, their numbers tend to track pretty evenly, so you don't see spikes in improvements or, you know, in a, a worsening of the, the injury rate in that particular environment. But that's, that's something that we continuously track, and we can provide more detail in future presentations regarding those trends. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. We, we just want to provide a flavor of the variety of metrics that we provide. Um, the vehicle liability that mentioned uh, that's mentioned there, we look at total accidents every year and we monitor for 
what was preventable, what was not preventable. If it was preventable, was there an offense that was committed, such as speeding, unsafe lane change, and so forth? Security. We have many partners and, and organizations that provide services that supplement the overall safety effort of our company. That includes division safety, other organizations such as environmental affairs. One of those key partners is security. Their presence is integral in protecting our employees, protecting our assets, and responding to unusual occurrence reports. Corporate safety does monitor the reports with an eye for the safety and welfare of our employees. And that being said, as was stated, there was an incident that occurred in February that was concerning. My understanding is that the, the intruder entered through the doors of uh, you know, an area that was not intended to be publicly accessible. Um, and this person ended up in one of our restrooms where employee encountered the intruder. So this is a very concerning incident. Um, it highlights the importance of bolstering the safety and security of our employees. And um, you can see here a list that summarizes our increased security measures. But in the spirit of continuous improvement, we remain watchful to identify opportunities <coughs> for improvement. Yeah, it's interesting because the question that I had went to the safety and security of our security services or of security officers, not the people that they protect. It's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm now going to my, so I can jump ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm sorry. So, yes, we are very much concerned about the, uh, the welfare of our employees as well. Um, so the overarching theme that, I, that we wanted to relay to the board is the, the, the key policy. If an officer feels unsafe, they are empowered with the ability to pull back, to not apprehend, and to not engage. Um, but you know, that being said, there is a whole host of training. What makes you think that? Uh, this was uh, reported from our, sec our security director, our interim yeah, security director. Just saying that doesn't make it real. Um, and it certainly is not a substitute for officers having the equipment and policy being like written down and clear about how they engage when they are alone in remote workplaces. Um, and this is really, I mean, this is, this is a really serious issue from my perspective. We can't just say we've got to do. So, um, you know, I, I am not convinced that this organization, from a cultural perspective, supports employees saying, I don't feel safe, so I'm not going to do something. That is not my impression. My impression is otherwise, that people are encouraged to just get it done across a range of disciplines. And I think that we need to shift that. Agreed. Agreed. Um, from what I know about the security services training, they're also uh, trained in de-escalation techniques, self-defense, first aid, CPR, bloodborne pathogens um, for our facilities that store bulk chemical. Have you chem assessed that training, or are you, again, relying on what you're told by security services? Some of that training is provided by corporate health and safety. So that would be first aid, CPR, bloodborne <coughs> pathogens, heat illness, so some of those are directly provided by corporate health and safety. And so that information represents a mix of what corporate health and safety directly provides and the information that we've been provided by security. So Mark, let me go back to the first equipment, satellite radios for remote areas. So what you're telling me today is that um, in security, every security officer that's going to a remote area has a satellite radio? No, I'm not saying that, but they are expanding their availability of a variety of communication devices to make sure that there is a continuous um, stream of communication between the officer and their supervision or the watch commander, but that, that is something that is still ongoing and that there are gaps that need to be filled. And so Yeah, so I need a timeline for that. Yeah, because really we're talking about sending individuals into situations where they may be asked to specifically encounter people 
uh, a person or multiple persons where they may or may not have contact with a DWP employee or help. Um, and I just, I don't understand. Uh, for me, that, it, from my perspective, that is a serious corporate safety issue. And it is, you know, sort of the job of corporate safety to be both skeptical and aggressive <laughs> as it relates to making sure that employees have what they need to do their jobs across the organization. Um, and I don't know, I, you know, we, we heard this matter in, in, in the context of a, a grievance, but I don't know how long this has been the case. It concerns me that it has not yet been remedied. And there comes a point where if you can't, if it can't be remedied, you're gonna have to pull back on what you expect of an employee. I mean, you certainly can't expect an employee to engage with third parties um, in remote areas alone and unable to contact anybody. So in my mind, that would be the policy shift. You either provide the equipment or you stop the activity, but you can't simply say we have a gap and we're working on it. Sir. Yes, may I answer your questions? Uh, satellite radios, we ordered a dozen two weeks ago. They're on the way in. Uh, once those get there, our officers that are reporting to remote locations will check those out from the watch commander and take those with them. And every shift, they'll rotate uh, taking those, those radios with them. Uh, we only order 12 because we don't go out to the remote locations very often. Uh, most of our officers are stationed in Basin. Uh, we do have officers stationed at Lone Pine. They already have satellite radios. They've had those satellite phones, I should say, uh, for the last eight to 10 years. So we do have one that can communicate from our remote location. Also, uh, written a policy that I sent to labor relations to review for responding to remote locations. So that should be sent out to our troops probably within the next two or three weeks once it's finalized. So, so if I understand this, so the supervisors will have the satellite radios and when they ask someone to go to a remote location, then they, that person will be given one as they're going. They'll check it out at the beginning of their watch. There'll be a 10. So we usually have two or three patrols per shift. So each supervisor will check out a satellite radio and then check it back in. Uh, when the next shift comes in, they'll have radios available if the officers have not returned, returned. So we have redundancy and availability of radios or satellite phones, I should say. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the final part of my presentation just regards just uh, completing the circle here with corporate health and safety is our COVID resource office efforts. Cal OSHA just implemented their non-emergency COVID standard. It'll be, it'll sunset in two years. So the COVID resource office will be instrumental in the next two years with our contact tracing efforts and relaying um, information to our divisions in the event that there's a potential work-related exposure. So this is the paradigm that we can expect for the next couple of years. Control measures such as face coverings, physical distancing, cell screening, cleaning, and, and disinfection. Those are the menu of options that Calusha expects that we would implement in the event of need, but otherwise they're not um, required on an indefinite basis. And so with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dan, who will go over our system safety effort. Thank you, Mark. Um, Dan, yeah, I'm Dan Ashelman, as Nazir introduced, and I just appreciate this opportunity to present to this board and just wanna, um, while sometimes it's uncomfortable to be in the hot seat, uh, what it represents to me and to the workers that we represent in the field is that this board of commissioners and this leadership team has an unwavering support for safety of our employees. So thank you for that. Um, so pivoting into the next part of this, it's system safety. That is a group that is uh, primarily made up of people who come from the craft, um, different levels of the field organizations, and they are brought together in these system safety groups and are subject matter experts in the work that they do. Um, and you can see here from this slide, many of the things they do is they're conducting crew visits. They're out there actively engaging with our, our field workers. They're developing and conducting safety meetings. Much of that content is 
from some of the incidents that you mentioned where um, our employees are injured and, and we need to learn from those, not just talk about it, but truly learn from those. And to say that we've done that and learned, we need to be able to prevent reoccurrence. That is the ultimate goal. Um, one of the other areas that they work on is uh, injury reduction strategies. And this is just a little bit of a shift from uh, for us. It's We'll get into more detail on this uh, in some subsequent slides, but really it's an opportunity for us to not so much tell workers what they need to do to be safe, but rather listen. Um, so it's more of a conversational approach. We sit down, we bring the workers who are currently exposed to these hazards um, in a very structured way with um, metrics of using lagging metrics of past injuries and talk about specific injuries that occurred to this group of, of workers and ask them about what those, the context of their work and to understand what they do and to include them in the solution process. So that's another key strategy that we work on out of this group. Uh, the next slide, oh, that's me, okay. <laughs> All right, so this is uh, just a, a slide to talk about the safety system consolidation. Um, this has just been an important new move for us. Mr. Benjamin has taken a major step forward in aligning our power system safety and water system safety groups under one centralized reporting structure. Uh, we're working towards adding a future joint system safety, so this is one of the growth opportunities that we do have and look forward and need it sooner than later. But um, yeah, this is this is a great opportunity for us uh, in the past, we've had safety silos throughout the department. I think those type of things exist in any organization. On uh, the bigger and more complex, probably the more you find those silos. But we're seeing with this centralized reporting structure, we're better together. Um, we, we are able to uh, find solutions and work through those together uh, and learn corporately. So um, we just see that we learn more effectively as an organization um, as we have this and we're able to share and not have to reinvent the wheel like was mentioned earlier. So, and, and share those enterprise wide. So this is just kind of, you can kind of look at this slide almost like a timeline. So should an injury occur um, out in the field, this kind of shows some of the interaction between the groups. So um, starting with an injury or accident, should something like that occur, system safety is generally the group that is first to respond at the scene. Um, they're out there um, making, the, assisting the division or the organization in making the area safe. Um, they're starting the chain of communication that has to flow out of this. Coordination starts immediately even with corporate health and safety where um, they sometimes are out at the scene, especially when we have an outside agency like Cal OSHA um, show up on scene just to facilitate that conversation. Um, updates uh, on the just the real-time information that's happening starts to be shared across our organization with our labor partners. Um, and the system safety groups are also usually the front line for uh, instigating, or not instigating, but implementing the downed worker program, which is really there to employ, uh, support employees and their families. And just to give that a little bit of a plug, that is employee funded. That just, I think in my mind, it highlights um, the family atmosphere that we have here, um, The employees care for other employees and that they're willing to um, support that with their pocketbooks. So that's an important program that we have and it's, and it's there to really facilitate the family so that they can be focused on the recovery of their loved ones. So. Um, then moving across, as they're there on the scene, they're gathering information, um, and then starts the incident learning, which is uh, a shift for us from the, the investigation type of what we're looking to blame and, and try to point fingers and more. Um, what can we as an organization do to improve? Uh, what can we understand about the context that we may have not understood before from talking to the employees, talking with their peers, um, and gathering that information. And one of the, this happens with a, a group of people, our labor partners are there, um, co-workers are there, management is there. Um, all the, all the, um, the relevant parties are, are represented there, the pertinent parties are represented there to uh, have their input in that. And then the output from those type of incident learning uh, communications really is recommendations. What can we do to improve uh, employees' safety? What can we do to prevent reoccurrence? That is the ultimate goal. Um, and then we work very closely with the divisions and with labor um, to implement those divisions, those, uh, those recommendations. So that kind of just is a brief overlook at the timeline of, of how we respond as a group in an organization <coughs> through an incident. Next slide. This one talks about the safety culture perception survey. It's been since uh, 2017, since we've done one of these, quite a, I think COVID kind of put a little break in that. Hopefully we don't have that long of a time frame to understand uh, our employees' perception of the safety culture in which they show up to work in every day. Uh, this was done in 
close collaboration with the JSTI, the Joint Safety and Training Institute. They were just integral partners in this. And looking at this slide, um, it's, a, it's a little bit of a graph, but I'll back up a minute and just say this, on this perception survey, almost 6,000 of our employees uh, voiced their opinions, um, gave their perceptions of how safety is for them and shared their comments, which uh, is very meaningful. They took the time to actually write comments there and, and add those for us to review. So looking at this slide, you see um, along the left injury rates and then it moves along and kind of gives a graph that shows a culture. So in almost all companies, there's a direct correlation between the two, depending on where you're at in your culture and how progressive you are in having a good, strong safety culture. Uh, that directly correlates to injury rates. And so uh, we're no different, right? There is a correlation there. And there's what you've highlighted, there's a lot of room for improvement um, for us. So there's work to be done to this end. So right now we're in kind of working through the results of these comments and data to understand where we are and where we want to be. Um, and then it's going to pivot into strategic planning where we're collaborating with leadership, <coughs> our employees, our labor partners, and safety to develop a roadmap of how we intend to improve the safety culture. Uh, there's a lot of data that was collected out of this. This was a, it was um, a company that was brought in with JSTI to help us review this. And there's a lot of metrics that we received um, from this, from our employees' input. So I think there's a, there's a lot for us to sift through, but it's an, it's an exciting time and we see it as an opportunity. Uh, a survey like this is one of our leading metrics. This is, these are the things that we like. It's before, we're not reacting to an injury, rather we're trying to understand the situation and, and come up with a way to um, prevent injury going forward and improve our safety culture. I'm not sure what this slide is supposed to be communicating. <clears throat> so, so looking at injury rates, so looking at injury rates along the left side, um, the higher up, that, that, would, that would represent the higher injury rates. Um, and then moving along that, it represents the different cultures where um, reactive, dependent, um, are kind of more into the um, compliance-based culture, like we follow the rules really well. And then that cultural bridge in the center is kind of the tough spot, the hump for a lot of companies to get over. Um, I, will, I will share that that's a bridge we have to get over. The, the detail from this is this maybe could be shared in a subsequent presentation to the board to share where we're at, but we're not um, over into the um, commitment culture phase, which is more uh, when the employees start to internalize their safety and internalize it and, and are watching out for each other. So. so you would say just based on your initial analysis, and then you can come back and report in more detail that we fall more in the compliance culture than the commitment culture. Um, and um, gotcha. And I assume that as this sort of transition over, because you have what I'm trying to understand is where you have injury rates, you have this downward slope. Does that correlate to anything, or does that correlate to what you would expect as you move from compliance to commitment? It does. Co so this is this um, is the model, right? This, this is, is not this is not LADWP data. So I think yeah, this is like the idea to, yeah. behind right. the model of you know that injury rates should go down yeah, that's what as I, we that's transition to a commitment culture. So we would love to see the results of that survey 6, at a future yeah. meeting. It sounds like you're developing some actions based on it, which is really good, and we'd love to hear that plan. Um, I'll also say I don't know if you've done any benchmarking, but knowing that a lot of these environments and jobs are very challenging and there's understandably risk involved. I'd be interested to see where our injury rates are and where our culture is as compared to other utilities, maybe water for water, power for power. There's got to be data out there and I'd be interested in that benchmarking if it's taken place or if it hasn't, it'd be good to look at, you know, how do our injury rates compare to people in similar jobs in other organizations. That's, that's right, because this, this slide looks very academic to me. And so, you know, 6,000 people responding is a lot. So I want to know, out of those 6,000 people, do they feel safe in their job? You know, and if they don't, how can we improve that? Yeah. But I like, I like Commissioner Katz's idea about also doing benchmarking, because this is dangerous work. We acknowledge that. And as a board, you know, safety is a priority for us. So, you know, less academic and more kind of like, you know, in the weeds in that I, you just said that that will come in the future. But yeah. you were saying that based on what you've seen, we've got a, a lot of growth uh, opportunity, uh, both 
in reality and also as reflected by the uh, survey that you did. Yes, Bill. No. Okay. And, and this, this slide, although it is academic, this is, was provided to us by the um, group that put the survey together for us, and this does represent some level of benchmarking. Um, this graph was developed by their um, working with thousands of companies and working also with utility companies in specific. So when we're plotted on this, we do have that opportunity, and that will surely come out in, in a more detailed presentation where you can see where we land. And um, there's also opportunity to break this down in a more granular way where we can look at specific groups within the department and understand where they land, because there is a spectrum there, but for the most part, um, we're on the wrong side of the cultural bridge at this point. Yeah, and it'd be helpful to know if there are, with this company you're working with, if they can provide any best practices. Are there utility companies that are on the other side of that bridge and what have been their practices that have helped lead there. It sounds like that's what they're working on, so we look forward to hearing about that. Absolutely. Good thank start. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so we'll transition into some of the other groups that are within the umbrella of corporate health and safety. Um, this is talking about our uh, occupational health and safety group, which is led by Dr. Israel. Mm -hmm. She's our chief physician. She has a staff of 20 administrative uh, and medical personnel there. Their main function, their primary function is really to triage, evaluate, and treat occupational injuries and illnesses. Um, they perform medical evaluations for new hires and our commercial drivers. Uh, some of our employees are in the, fall into those categories. Uh, they administer the OSHA medical surveillance programs, which is important and highlights even to some of the things that Mark brought up where we expose our employees to hazards. They need to be medically fit and cleared to do, to do so, to do the things that we're asking them to do. Um, and her group helps significantly in that way. They also evaluate employees when there's a suspicion of drug or alcohol impairment on the job uh, and support LADWP policies and protocols. Uh, they review and verify medical notes for absence due to chronic conditions or connections with a prior disability, and they work with the divisions to, to make sure that these employees are placed in appropriate work environments. And they're finally, they're responsible for the safekeeping of our employees' confidential medical records, which we're required to have, but that is the warehouse for all those records. Next slide. So looking at this is just a... Um, Sorry, we went backwards. We're right here. Uh, gentlemen, we're going to break in just uh, in okay. 10 minutes. It's just been going on for a while. Sure, and we yeah. We can read the slides, so. Okay, so I'll, I'll get through this. This is just uh, to, to sum this up, this is an injury prevention model. It kind of, you could see the main headings of data collection, data analysis, uh, and prevention strategy. We use this um, <coughs> to, to really essentially digest this information and then coordinate with the division. So it's using a lot of metrics data, both leading and lagging indicators, digest that information and work with the uh, divisions in the management to prevent injury. So this is kind of a way that we're converting from being reactive uh, to proactive and using leading and lagging information to directly prevent injuries. Next slide. Um, what we have here is just the injury prevention synergy. This is the group as a whole. Um, everything that exists with under the umbrella of the Office of Corporate Health and Safety and really shows the interactions between the group and really the synergy that's created by all these groups working together. They're directly involved in employee care um, both before, during, and after an incident. This is most effective under a centralized umbrella as we have it now and we hope to see that expand and grow um, to improve this, but um, this really fosters that that interaction between the groups. So. On the one side, you see the leading indicators. Um, those are, again, like we pointed out, those are the things that really we're trying to um, mobilize and use that information before something actually occurs. And then on, on the other side of this, we see lagging. And that's really not how we want to be making decisions, but that's what rather a way for us to measure how effective, how well are we doing um, our work. So that's more of a tool for us to check ourselves. And finally, um, Let's end here with the Office of Corporate Health and Safety goals. Um, this slide where shows where we are now and our goals going forward. And just starting with injury reduction, um, we talked a little bit about that, but that's where we're taking a close look at all of our injuries. We're talking with our employees. We're partnering with them to develop the prevention strategies. Um, and again, like I said, this is done in more of a focused way. 
Uh, what's represented here is, is the five divisions of the department that have the highest rate of injury, and that's where we're um, really focusing at this point. We hope to see this expand into every division. Um, but this is where we, we really leverage that information from our employees and include them in the process. Um, moving over to strategic planning, this the, in the center it shows really uh, some of the uh, initiatives where we've grown and hope to grow with the addition of the joint safety. Um, and we're hoping to see some alignment of programs like Mark elaborated on with uh, safety by design to see that be a holistic kind of a, a department wide initiative where it's happening very well in some groups and we just hope to spread that, spread the good stuff around for sure. Um, contractor safety, we, have, we need to take a little closer look at how we um, view our contractors and the safety and especially the touch points where our contractors interact with our employees. That's been a touch point in the past and we wanna do a better job there. Um, and we wanna be able to share these successes across all the points of business. Again, we don't want the silos to exist. We wanna be able to improve communication. Um, improvements to our safety management system, like Mark had, had mentioned earlier, there's, there's, we need to see this software come on board. We're, we're at the end of the procurement process, but this is gonna integrate with what we already have um, so that we can get real-time data and use that data uh, in a more effective way and that can be more broadly shared throughout the enterprise uh, and we can learn from it. Um, let me just wrap up here, I think, with uh, just a comment. It's, we, we at Safety strongly believe, it's been mentioned here, that every injury is preventable. This is somewhere we need to go moving forward. Um, that needs to be part of the fabric of our culture. Um, we aim to investigate and look at and, and learn from every incident with that end to prevent it, and we want that to be part of uh, what our employees actually believe. Uh, just a really quick question. Um, where you have the injury reduction, you have numbers in each of those boxes. What do those numbers represent? Those numbers rec rec uh, represent the um, actual recordable injuries that we record on an OSHA 300 log. So those are injuries that were significant enough to go beyond first aid um, that we had to record in that, in that log. And so is those, that over what time frame? That is over uh, a year. So that is last year. More injuries that is the, in water distribution than power transmission distribution. That's surprising. Okay. Yeah. You, I don't, you may recall a, a previous presentation when they first analyzed this, they looked at the five places that were the highest injuries, and so they did focus programs mm -hmm. with the divisions to try to look at exactly what was getting injured and how to attack that to drive the number down. Those are top five. Those are the top five okay. that they specifically targeted the yep. program. And one of them has actually uh, moved off the top five and been replaced. So they, they've been effective. Their management has, has engaged with their employees and, and it's it's shown in the reduction of injuries. Perfect, yeah. So these, good, these yeah. are the number of injuries. You have 18.2, what's the point? So, so that's a rate, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a total recordable injury rate and it represents kind of an industry standard that um, it assumes how much injuries we'll have per 100 employees. I mean, it's used to compare or benchmark with other groups. Oh, so those are those so are these rates. are rates. Those are rates. No, yes, those are not actual okay. injuries. Yeah, that's okay. why. Yeah, there's okay. not, there's Got not it. two tenths of an injury there. I'm sorry <laughs> if that wasn't clear. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's a rate. Okay, thank but you. But it's a benchmarking rate that's used, you know, industry wide. Okay. Thank hey, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Good you. Good presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like uh, to uh, put the meeting in recess. Uh, I've got a hard out at 2.30, and if any of us leave, we have no commission board meeting. So um, if we could take 15 minutes uh, for recess and also give people a chance to grab their, at least a bite of their lunch if necessary, uh, that would be great. So we'll be back at 12.15. We have two more presentations. Yep. Plus closed session.
It'll be just a moment. Please bear with us. Good afternoon, Madam President. We are recording. President McLean Hill. Present. Vice President Ruiz. Present. Three board members, a quorum is present. All right, so we will move to item three in the management reports on information technology services. Good afternoon, commissioners. Afternoon. I have with me today uh, Rita uh, Karani Carwile. She's one of uh, my senior leadership uh, members in IT, one of five women. Uh, so I want to give a shout out to my IT team for Women's Month uh, because of uh, out of the senior leadership in IT, there are five of us out of the seven. So they represent 85% of our organization and there's Thanks. many, many more within our organization that do incredible job. I mean, literally yesterday I was complimenting a couple of them about some pr things that they put in over the weekend. So um, my thanks to all the women on my, on my team. Without them, we would be probably worse off. I mean, they do a lot. I mean, really. <laughs> so they, they can manage things better than uh, us guys sometimes and everything else. But um, uh, today, uh, I know that we're going to give an overview of some of these uh, major programs that are within IT that cross many of our uh, divisions. Uh, so there's going to be others that may be supporting us as questions come up. Go to the next slide. I'm sorry. Okay. So um, what, I, what I've done here is to give you an overview is the project name, which I will give you some detail behind. Um, I didn't want to clutter a, a slide here. The project health is based on a color code, okay? And unfortunately, they don't have a key in here, but I will tell you what the color codes represent. Green represents that both the project budget, schedule, and um, schedule, and what am I missing? Scope are all, uh, are, are all on track. So if it's green, it's that way. It's yellow if any one of those have been missed and it'll be red if there's any red in any one of those three categories. And then I have the start to say date. that I like this format because I was reviewing it um, uh, before the meeting and I like it simple, a dashboard, I can see where the problems are, so I appreciate this. And uh, well, thank you very much, I appreciate that. This uh, actually comes from Lewis Carr's originally working here before me, uh, working with uh, the previous board members to come up with this dashboard, so I give them a lot of credit on that. Um, the I will. I do have detail if you ever need it uh, associated with these that we can always deep dive in them. But I'll, I'll start off with the LEDWP SharePoint site. This is our intranet site associated with uh, LEDWP. This would be for internal use only between the different groups and divisions and individual customers, I mean uh, individual uh, users of uh, employees of the department. Um, this particular uh, program has started a while back. It's in the yellow status because we're behind on, on our timeline for sure. Um, this is a collaborative thing where we will be using Microsoft's 365 SharePoint to put out the new divisional pages for all the different groups. We've had some successes with some pilots associated with the different groups. Um, the Board of Commissioners and, uh, for Water and Power has been put out there, the Water uh, System homepage, Water Executive Office, and Water Quality were all very successful. Those were put in last year. But since then, our so team- I Just a quick question, a quick question um, about the whole presentation. Um, you've got a list of projects, some of which are more significant and or interdependent as it relates to programmatic activities we have than others. So I'm very curious to understand from a priority perspective in looking at this long list, um, and in particular in looking at the pieces that are read, um, you know, what this represents. And I'm really curious um, if the project that is connected to, say, our smart grid is on this list um, and how we would understand, you know, sort of the mission critical IT projects yeah, that, and, and um, that your office is working on as opposed to just a group of projects. Okay. 
Uh, let me answer your one question about the smart grid one. The, di the distribution automation one is not on this list. Um, Isn't that pretty critical from the yeah, perspective? Yeah, and uh, I will, and I will admit that that is a complete failure on my part. That should have been on here um, because that was on our list last time, and I can't believe that I forgot it because I was going through and checking them, and um, I'm like, oh, I think I got everything, and I, I, I obviously missed that one because that one is very critical to us, and we are working very closely with um, Simon P. Joyce groups to um, try and architect that properly. You should have um, had Rita check it. <laughs> I, I, I should have, uh, exactly, and I apologize about missing that, but I, I can give you a, a quick overview of that one. That one um, would definitely be in red status. Um, that one That's is... That's hugely problematic and concerning, and I guess the reason for this, the reason to understand these updates is because they bear direct relationship to the actual performance and operations of our business. Um, and they also have serious budget implications because if we're not going to deploy something, then that has implications for our short-term and long-term budget planning. And so, you know, I'm, you know, we've got two new commissioners sitting here, so it's difficult for them to look at this and to understand how it integrates or layers on top of anything. Um, so. So if you're saying that that's in the red, I think there's a lot more explanation to be done around that because it's not just sure. in IT, it's standing up the IT in order to service. That's correct. You know, Absolutely. a significant <clears throat> operation in power. So that's a huge thing um, that I'm gonna wanna understand more about. Um, not today, but soon, like a in Absolutely. April. I can work um, on that for you, absolutely. In addition to that, when I look and I see, you know, LA DWP website redesign in red. And I mean, I've been on the board now three years and it's been a priority item for three years. And so much of what we do is um, inhibited by that most public interface. Um, it's just disturbing that we have yet to come up with a, a, a way of dealing with that. Um, but when I move to the other pieces that are in red, well, so, so the contract contact center platform procurement, which is in yellow, I certainly want to understand that. But you've got some pieces here around that seem to relate to the ERB, which we've been told, um, the ERP, which we have been told is like foundational to huge systems transformations at the department and they're red and yellow. So I need to understand that. Absolutely. Would you like me to just focus on those ones right now because of the time crunch? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with the contact um, center platform. So the IVR stands for Integrated Voice Recorder. Um, and what that is, it's the phone system by which uh, uh, the customer procurement team, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, the customer service uh, division utilizes to, to communicate with our customers. Um, it is antiquated. Um, we realized that. Um, it was realized uh, when I first joined, people were talking about that this was needed to be replaced. I know that working with the CSD team, this has been an ongoing thing. We're currently in the process of reviewing the RFP responses to replace that system right now. So there was a number of responses um, associated with this particular um, uh, program. And out of that program, I, uh, the procurement should be completed. Um, it looks like we're saying November at this point in time, but I've heard just recently an update this morning from my team that that may be coming in. It may be earlier um, for the development of, then we can move to the next step once it's been decided and it would need to come to the board to present to them, present to all of you that, uh, you know, hey, this is the, uh, uh, system that we have chosen to move forward with. Now this system is unique in that it will just make our old system look like something from the Stone Age. This will be a, a unique system that will integrate multiple systems across things so that the customer service reps can have access, real-time access to the customer's information as they call in so they can help them with either, you know, billing issues or setting up some type of, of, of a service necessary for either maybe turning on their service, re turning off their services, or maybe repairs that may need to be so done. they don't have access to that information now? They do, but it's in multiple systems. So what it, it's, it's, it's 
it's the fact that they may have to log into another system um, to get it. And even though it's there, it's present, but it just it's time consuming. So these this are will the be challenges a challenge that we have. And I mean, we look at the work that our employees are doing in order to meet certain timelines and metrics or to deliver service to our customers. Signif they are significantly hampered by antiquated technology. Um, CSD has long been uh, looking for updates that will allow them to better integrate information and data so that they can more, uh, in, in a much more timely and comprehensive way, serve our customers. So I think that just, I always get concerned when, you know, I have one person presenting to me and they start talking about what's happening someplace else. So, you know, procurement's doing this, that, or a third thing. Only because I think as an organization, we have got to identify what our priorities are and lean in from every single touch point so that they get achieved. Um, it can't be critical for for CSD and business as usual for procurement or you know, low on the list for IT. And I'm not saying any of those things are true, except I know it's critical for CSD. Um, but, you know. It's foundational for the entire department. This is, this is <laughs> and it's in customer's yellow. number one. And it's in yellow. Yeah, it is. Um, I will tell you that we realize that we're running late on the procurement um, of, of identifying who to go forward with. So the IT team did something in the behind because the system that we are currently working on was becoming antiquated, as you mentioned. And so we upgraded that because we know that to put this system in properly, we're, we were worried that we could have a system that might crash or you know, cause an outage in, in the fact of having uh, an IVR. So my team went ahead with the fact that we knew we were behind schedule with the development of the new contact center. We upgraded uh, the current system so that we can at least feel comfortable that it will last as an interim solution until we get the new contact center in. And you mentioned, um, uh, Madam President, about the fact that, hey, we have all these processes, and this is another thing, it's just up on the top, I'll only mention it for a, a moment here. Actually, it's uh, process mining. Um, we're working with IBM along with CSD to come in and evaluate the 300 plus processes, and I'm probably incorrect about the number, uh, George Rafael could probably correct me, it might be even larger than that. And we're analyzing them with data to say how we can become better in our process efficiency of optimizing our what we do and everything else. And we're using new technology from IBM around the AI perspective to actually investigate that and come up with better solutions. That will be part of the integration into other systems that we will move forward with. It's We've done a proof of concept right now. It's ongoing. We're in phase two of it, of five different systems. We're starting small to say, hey, what what does this look like to see if it'll actually work in, for us? And already the data that's been collected from it looks like there could be some really neat improvements that come out of this. I, we're, we're really excited about the project. I know that George is as well, and um, we're looking forward to the outcome of this going forward. And then so, we have the website read, and we, we don't even have an end date. <clears throat> so, so let me explain that real quick. So the website is correct. Uh, we This one, um, we were ready to submit um, and, and I remember um, Madam President talking about this a long time ago when I first joined. Um, we put out an RFP. The RFP uh, was ready to go forward. Um, we were working with uh, what we call the NOC, the Notice of Compliance with the Union, uh, back in the August timeframe. I will have to validate that with some colleagues to make sure that is the correct date. And we worked with them for a period of time, and then it was finally released uh, for uh, consumption by bidders in the January timeframe. We received back multiple bidders, uh, two actually. Uh, there was a third that was gonna be in there, but they were disqualified because they originally came up with the requirements, so they had a unfair advantage over um, other uh, vendors. <clears throat> and we, <clears throat> excuse me, we have already had their presentations. We're reviewing them right now. Last. Uh, was, I'm, I'm trying to remember the date. It was last week we actually had the presentations. We went through them, and now we're going to be evaluating and moving forward with it. So once we evaluate the uh, presentations and come up with the winner of the um, RFP, we will then move forward with the procurement aspect and also present to you, uh, you know, who we've selected to put into the Drupal site. Uh, so the ERP. 
Yes, we can move to the next page. ERP. Um, we'll, we'll focus on um, phase two, three, and uh, phase two and three, and I'm going to let Rita talk a little bit about that because she's she's Let's our. Let's focus on, on phases two, three, and four, which is yellow. Yes. Um, so good morning or good afternoon, oh, I'm sorry. commissioners. Just the, the two red boxes and the yellow box. I see it's two yeah. and three. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. So um, ERP, as you know, is our foundational back office system with multiple phases. So procurement, I think, will let. Uh, it is not in green right now with some of the change in leadership in uh, procurement. So we are, we are actually going to be putting that on hold uh, based on the request from uh, the new director. So then none of it's in green. We Correct. Are just yeah, behind. it was in green when we pre prepared the status. However, no, I understand. Yeah, and so right now, mm -hmm. uh, phase one, we are uh, making sure that all of our users and our new director, of course, has to be comfortable with the strategic direction. So with that, I'll move to phase two and three. Uh, phase two is about the HR payroll. Uh, and along with that, there are time capture, safety, incident reporting as a component of that, benefits. So there are about 10 streams in there. So Workday, when they came in and when they were selected, they recommended about 18, 19 months time frame. We knew that our systems currently and our processes are very decentralized and highly complex with a lot of uh, interdependencies. Uh, but I thought the, the goal was to move forward in a way yeah. that we did not replicate right. the yeah. decentralized, yeah. highly complex. Right. Exactly. So untangling some of that, our concern was that untangling all those integrations because uh, HR, which has the people component and the pay component, is a foundation to everything in the department. And then our phase three, which is financials, has work orders and general ledger, which is again very, very critical and embedded throughout a lot of our systems. So we have uh, resource issues, I think we have pointed out right from the start, that a lot of the people who started these systems, uh, we're like on third, fourth generation of people. So, and there are very few people who understand the current systems. So um, a, a lot of the decisions and questions are going to them. And there were some unexpected operational items, you know, such as uh, retrofitting our current systems for COLAs, the new contracts that happened in October, November timeframe. So some of that uh, delay is directly attributed to our team being pulled away to work on the cost of living. Yeah, I just have to tell you that, and this, you know, again, this kind of goes above your heads. This is a, a general senior management issue. We've got to make a decision about how important it is to get certain things done and then put the resources behind getting those done. If we keep spreading ourselves out in a way that we don't achieve the technological um, upgrades that we need, we're going to just spend an inordinate amount of time trapped in the old systems and the old processes. And, you know, it's going to take much, much longer to get anywhere. The old systems continue to deteriorate. We continue to invest more in maintaining them. All the while, we're not making the transitions that we need to make, and it doesn't get easier the longer it takes. So doing a little bit of everything is not the path to success. We've got to make decisions about what we're going to achieve and get that thing done, which may mean that we're not going to get some other things done. And those are the choices that, that have to be both made and then adhered to because the ERP being this behind is hugely troubling. Between ERP being behind and the smart grid work being not represented and behind, I... Yeah, so I think what you're saying here is uh, absolutely important that the support from this group and our leadership is very critical to the success of ERP. So we want to make sure that 
uh, so we have, we're going to be asking for another year. We are working with our stakeholders. So Anne's team, uh, our DEI team who are key stakeholders. We are asking for, we've come up with a new ba proposed baseline uh, with the contractor uh, in order to implement by 2025. And we think that that's doable as long as, you know, we continue to receive support uh, well, on at priorities. At some point, somebody's got to be accountable for getting stuff complete, period. Um, and in an environment where your efficiency and your competitiveness and your viability depended on your internal efficiency and getting stuff done, this would happen. And we can't, on the one hand, be the nation's largest municipal utility. Um, and just by sheer scale, um, you know, an enterprise as big as we are. And then on the other hand, act like we're a mom and pop operation that can't get it together and can't upgrade our technology. I mean, we just, and it's nobody's, nobody's responsible. And we just, oh, well, we'll kick it down another year. This is just not acceptable. So what I'd like to see is I'd like to understand from a business perspective what it is we're trying to achieve and how it affects our operations. Because at the end of the day, all of this has implications for operations. And what the, what the staffing plan is to get it done. I mean, we have a staffing plan for everything else and we get stuff done all the time. We save the aqueduct. So, you know, this is, you know, we've got to, uh, to pursue the work that the joint system is doing with the same level of urgency and diligence that we pursue the work that we're doing out in our fields. And the fact that everything that happens at joint has implications for what's going to happen or for what's happening for servicing the business units, the, the systems, you know, that can't be lost either. So um, these are nice. The asterisks, the 2020, the asterisks, what do those mean? So we have a new proposed baseline uh, that we have presented to our executive uh, committee. So that uh, so that's what it indicates that we're going to be shifting by a year at least for uh, HR and payroll phase two and then also the financials, whereas the procurement at this point is uh, on hold till we have a better strategic alignment uh, with the new executive management. So there's a lot of work, commissioners, that has gone on. There's always yeah. a lot of work, but the point is there's no result. Um, on the contrary, <clears throat> We have gone through almost 50% uh, of the project. We have uh, completed over the last year, we implemented the new budget system. Uh, Maximo has a huge dependency and so does the work management systems and fleet have dependencies to tie in with uh, the ERP. So we have made tremendous progress in upgrading those so to bring everything up together. And uh, some of our sister organizations also started before us and they are experiencing similar delays because there are, uh, it, this is not completely an IT project, right? There, there's a lot of involvement from HR, payroll, all the subject matter experts. No, no, I understand that. Yeah. Understand me when I say there's no result. Mm -hmm. In my mind, that is not that there's no progress. When I say there's no result, I mean we are not done. We're not yeah. finished, and we don't have, and we are not going to meet our finished date. So these systems aren't in operation. So lots of people are working, right? But you know the benefits that the both money that we're spending on the systems and frankly, the money that we're spending on the salaries of all of the people that are working, those mm -hmm. benefits aren't translating into results for our customers and for the citizens of LA. That's the bottom line. That's what a result is. Right. So we have got to get more focused on those results. Yeah, we are. And for me, my concern obviously is a website because my perception is that's the number one touch point with our customers. And I go on the website all the time and it's not easy to navigate. Yeah. 
You know, it's, yeah. you ha it's so it's it's not intuitive. So that's why I feel for me the the website really is should be a high priority. And I know we have a lot of stuff going on, and that's what the president said. Let's prioritize and put our efforts in certain things that we want to get done. Right. Yeah, my priority is the ERP. Uh, Mark has other assistant well, directors that, committed to the other ones. We need to have the, the priority has to has to roll up to the organizational priority. It can't be because IT can't make FSO do anything. That's correct. Right. Right? That's so great. your priority is kind of irrelevant at a certain level. It has got to be, which is why I said it is a management issue. This organization has to determine what is necessary for it to function at the level that it you know, ought to be functioning for its customers. Um, the smart grid has got to be a priority as it relates to what we've said we're going to deliver in terms of insight and information to our customers. So we've got to make some decisions about that. And then we have got to um, ensure that the appropriate resources, and that is staff time, is aligned to those priorities. Otherwise, we come in here, we talk, 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 talk. Then everybody goes back to doing what they do, and nothing changes. And what's even worse for me, nothing changes, and we don't even hear about it unless we ask. So I've heard nothing about these projects being delayed offline, who knows, re nothing, which is hugely problematic as well. So um, I don't have any other questions, and the report is pretty clear on its face. Does anybody else have questions? Not at this time. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we are committed to getting those projects done. It's I believe good. that. Yeah. Thank you. I believe that. Thank, Thank you very great. much. Thank, Thank you. you. And happy to learn that five is seven. It's a good ratio. All right. <laughs> Mr. Wilbur. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. All right. Um, so uh, by your request, I want to go through our after action uh, report uh, as related to the recent outages that we had. Make sure I can get this to work. Um, <clears throat> so starting Friday, February 4th, 24th, um, to Thursday, March 2nd, citizens of, Los, citizens of Los Angeles and surrounding areas went through a record-breaking storm, the likes of which that had not been seen in decades. Uh, following nearly nine inches of rain in January, uh, an additional seven inches of rain came in during the storm period, uh, followed by 60 to 80 mile per, hour, mile per hour winds. Our total outages were 211,279, about 13% of our customers. If the customers restored within 24 hours was 137,000, um, around 65% of our customers uh, of the outages that were restored. Our peak outage was 84,000, uh, which is about 5%, uh, occurring on Saturday around midnight. So I'll start up with the Owens Valley. Uh, in the Owens Valley, we had more than two feet of snow and high winds on the first day. Um, we were able to utilize some of our track diggers to transport crews, poles, materials to inaccessible locations. Um, we deployed around 20 transmission patrolmen. Uh, we pulled them up from Mojave, Victorville, um, and also our crews that are in Boulder, Nevada and Delta, Utah came down to assist with the restoration in Owens Valley. Um, we had a total of 46 poles that came down in Owens Valley, uh, 10 spans additionally of our 34.5 system uh, and 38 spans of our 4.8 system. You're not Mr. Rodriguez, right? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just, I just kept getting stuck on the first slide, Walter Rodriguez Jr., but okay. <laughs> so Walt, Walter's our, our director for power transmission and distribution. He was unable to be here today. Okay. Um, so I'm <laughs> So you're pinch hitting? So I'm pinch hitting, yes. Okay, Brian. So. Uh, specifically in Basin, uh, throughout the entirety of the storm, we had crews scheduled around the clock to respond to customer outages. Um, we had a total of 119 crews on the first day Friday, um, and averaged 102 crews per day after that first day. 
uh, PTD management coordinated with our partners at IBEW uh, Local 18 to bring in a total of seven contract line crews to augment our forces. Uh, the crews work 16 hour shifts until the response level returned to normal on March 2nd. Um, initially our outages were around 1600 on that first uh, wave of the storm. Uh, as soon as the wind kicked up, it increased to 84,000 in less than 12 hours. Wow. Um, we also used 33 of our vegetation management crews comprised of utility line clearance tree trimmers, um, as well as nine contract tree crews to help us combat the enormous number of trees. So some of our most affected communities, Delray had over 14,000 people out, Van Nuys 13,000, Valley Village 13, uh, the Hollywood Hills an additional 12,000, um, Hollywood another 11,000, Valley Glen 7,000, Jefferson Park 7,000, Studio City 6,000, and Sun Valley 4,000. Um, I think you can see from the pictures essentially what our main issue was, right? And that was the, the, the amount of trees that came down. We had a total of 72 trees um, uh, major tree issues that came down. Um, as you can see by the pictures, a lot of these, uh, actually the majority of them are along the property lines, which made restorations efforts uh, quite difficult. The water intrusion was the other issues that we had. Um, some of the, the biggest issues that we had specifically were in our distribution stations where we had water intrusion incidents um, that relayed uh, uh, some of the bus at a, and affected 13,000 customers at DS39, an additional 17,000 at DS57, um, in Hancock Park, an additional 14,000 uh, in uh, Hancock Park at our distribution station there, um, and another 18,000 on our Hollywood distribution station 52. Now, to essentially what the, the issue that I really wanted to bring forward here is really what were um, the, our after action plan. So this was the issues that happened there, um, but I wanted to go through some of the challenges that really came out. Um, and then rather than go through essentially what we're going to do and what we're planning on doing, like I want to effectively <laughs> go through what exactly what we're going to do right away. You've been, okay. It's so, okay. Um, we, we do have a lot of issues on here, right? And we have a draft of an after action plan that has very specific metrics on it, uh, responsible managers, right? And timelines on what we're looking to for long-term solutions to some of the issues that we had. Um, but I'll, I'll try to focus really on the immediate things that we can do now um, to help us in the next storm and the next outage. Right? Um, so first is a strategic communication plan, right? Although our electric trouble and our construction operations divisions, they prepared well for this, they communicated with each other, um, but we failed to create a comprehensive system for identifying which individuals and entities should receive specific types of information and how that information should be distributed to internal and external customers. Right? A communication plan needs to provide accurate and timely information to the public reducing the likelihood of misinformation and rumors spreading. And is that a plan that's developed by power system? Uh, actually, it's through our Office of Emergency Management, right? Okay, and how is that staffed? And is there an Office of Emergency Management for the department or for power system? And Yeah, so it's, it's uh, through our security um, uh, services group, right, that reports directly to Aram, and it's for the entire department. Okay, so in terms of developing a communications plan, you're saying that's through the Office of Emergency Management? Right, so they actually um, head up our command structure. So when we go through an incident command structure, right, they are uh, the, and the who, first level of that. who runs that? that? Um, uh, uh, Brian, Brian. Brian, Brian Lamb is, he's hiding here somewhere. Brian Lamb, there he is, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, his boss, uh, Alfred. Yeah. Uh, but Brian Lamb is our Office of Emergency Management. Um, he, so anytime we have mutual aid, any of our, um, or send up a command structure, whether it's by the city, by the department, or even by one of the systems, right, it starts with Brian Lamb. And does your command structure, I assume, include a PIU? And there are people from comms who are activated? So we're closely, yes, with Joe Romalo's group and the right. PIO, uh, also with the city's emergency management department. Um, and if the county stood up, we would communicate through the city emergency management department through the, through the state, through the city, county, and then through the state. So in this particular situation, was the Office of, of Emergency Management stood up? 
We were, but we were, the way it's structured in our office in the past before this incident, we were a conduit to support the, the systems. We weren't the one coordinating all the efforts. So you weren't in command then? Correct. Right. But you will be moving forward? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So our command structure within our electric trouble system for most of our storms, right, is where we, we have our command structure. Uh, moving forward, that's exactly what we want to look at is um, whether it's with the city, with the system, right, or with the department, right, running through the putting that incident command structure forward, right. So do we, have we put one together or are we still working on it? So we have some, some comprehensive and some actionable items that we are moving forward with, right. So we have a, a draft of our action plan. Um, that we're still completing, right, with Brian Lamb uh, and his Office of Emergency Management to move forward on this. Is this on a slide? Because I'm just looking at a tree. It's not. I think we're up no. out of sync, I think. <laughs> no. It's not uh, on a slide. Yeah. This has been the day of presentations and concept, <laughs> but not detailed. So um, these are some okay. of the challenges identified on the slide. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> The outage uh, management system was a challenge? I'm sorry? Is outage management system, oh, is that a challenge? Yeah, that's something that, that, I'll, that I'll move forward to right now. Okay. Um, uh, in addition to this, emergency planning and preparation, right? And that's uh, during the emergency, the goal of our system is to restore power as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. obvious, um, to the residentials and businesses of Los Angeles. Um, the objectives of the power system's emergency planning and preparation include, right, number one is protection of the and safety of the public and the department employees. Right. Um, and then next, having that framework to coordinate recovery and restoration efforts um, and the roles and responsibilities of the various divisions within the power system. So we receive our weather data from the Office of Emergency Management, right, on the severity of the upcoming storm to help make timely preparations. So during the, the normal day on February 23rd, right, power transmission distribution requested to have crews on standbys beginning at midnight um, that would work solely for our electric trouble board to assist the line patrol mechanics and restoration efforts. Uh, throughout the storm, they set up crews around the clock. So crews coming in at midnight, crews coming in at six, and crews working their regular shifts um, and had everyone working 16 hour shifts until the response level returned to normal. Well, you say you here you have a bullet that says trouble dispatcher vacancies. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Um, so one of our issues on uh, in our trouble dispatch office is the amount of vacancies that that we have there. Um, so this requires them to work uh, before or after shift. And so during a storm, having enough people in the dispatch office, right, to handle the, the amount of calls and the amount of work going out uh, becomes one of our biggest challenges. Uh, moving forward, we hire, we have a new hiring plan. We've been working with local 18 um, on increasing the amount of training that goes in and the amount of trainees that go per year. Essentially, we're doubling the amount of trainees that are going through. And that will address the vacancy issue when? So moving forward, so we have two classes that are in session right now. So we will start um, reaping that over the next six months. We'll start getting more and more uh, people um, going in and we'll continue that training program the way it's set up. And EDM staffing? EDM staffing is also a very big challenge for us, right? We have over 600 EDM uh, positions and we only have a little over 300 filled. Um, so we have more than 300 vacancies in our EDM classification. Um, I think our new IBW contract moving forward um, has certainly uh, taken out the, or reduced dramatically the amount of people that are leaving the department. Um, and we now have a lot more people looking to come into the department. So as a recruiting effort, um, it looks so far it's been successful moving forward. Um, okay. Moving forward, some, some of the damage assessment, restoration, execution, and planning. Um, so uh, planning appropriate response for, for capabilities and damage assessment can be difficult during these events. Um, it's very problematic, you know, obviously during rain and winter and winter storms, no different than it is during the summer storms. Um, but how we address these issues are much different. Our priorities during a storm, uh, during a rainstorm are far different than what we have uh, during a heat storm, right, and how we concentrate our efforts. We had an unprecedented number of trees, 72, that fell on our, on our system. Each of these require a patrol crew to go out, right, clear up the, the hazard, the electrical hazard of the area, right, and then a following tree crew to come in to remove that hazard, 
right? Once that tree goes in and sees and completes all of their work, then it's bringing a, a district crew back to set poles, string wires, and move them in. And that's really where the length of these outages came in. Um, and I think that was one of our biggest things here because of the sheer size and the, the area of the trees that came down, um, the restoration efforts were long um, as far as getting those trees trimmed enough to where we can get back in and set poles and, and pull in wire. And where it says centralized source of data, what is that a reference to? So, um, I can move on. So uh, our information, and this is something that we talked about or that Mark was discussing, right? Our customer service division receives reports from outages right, as it comes in, our IVR system. Um, and this is one of our biggest issues, is how our OMS, our outage management system, um, communicates with both our customer call center, um, our IVR system, and our outward facing um, outage map. And this became a, a big uh, contention point for most of the people that were suffering an outage, right? They weren't able to get the right information on how long their outage was gonna be, uh, the maps were inaccurate, um, they weren't getting good responses in their phone call, and there was an inconsistent message that went um, uh, on uh, out every every time that they would call in. So, in addressing this, right, and this is something that working with Mark Northrop on, and this is something that we were we were discussing, or he was discussing our IVR system and bringing all these systems together. Um, so, long term, we have a, a reconfiguration of the outage management system and how to modify all of these these particular programs. But as a short term solution, really, before we get to our our next uh, major storm or our major event, um, just it, tomorrow. Which, <laughs> yeah. So tomorrow's uh, you know we're not looking at a large storm event, so we don't uh, we don't anticipate it being a. I should not find that uh, that it's going to be a um, a, a big problem uh, over the next two days. Um, but the, the immediate response is really to have some dedicated staff. And we normally used to have liaisons between our call center um, and our electric trouble board that would report to the electric trouble board. Same thing with our outage management system. During COVID, we locked down our electric trouble because our dispatch office is such a critical component um, and with such a few amount of employees that we wouldn't allow people in and out of there. So we didn't allow people in, right? That's, that's over now, right? We can bring people back in. I think our immediate response to this is to have more people available there to be that liaison between those two systems, between our outage management system and our communication, our call center and our IVR system and our, our website. So that is our big goal moving forward as far as getting that data where it needs to go. Um, and then the other piece of that is, is also using non-essential personnel. Um, to help communicate uh, that back to the call center, right? Or back to the OMS system. Right now, when we have a, a, an outage or a tree fall or an, an, an incident, we send a crew out there. Um, we're reliant on that crew to radio back, right? Or make that phone call on what exactly the problem is, how it's gonna be remedied, remedied and uh, estimated time. So without having that information back, Right, we're, we're at a default on we'll do a blanket based on this, the number of outages or the number of people that are out. We'll put a blanket out there that it's gonna be 24 or 18 or whatever hours um, based on what we feel it is. And that's not accurate information. Um, but we're relying on the crew that's out there doing the work to be that message coming back. And um, most of the crews that are out there, right, they're in the middle of, of doing the work that needs to be done. Uh, they're not gonna take a break every 20 minutes, come in, right, so they can input on their computer what the issue is and what the estimated times are. So we're looking at is using non-essential personnel, um, our poll spotters, our training staff, um, and some of our superintendents to be able to go out ahead of them, right, analyze jobs so we have the proper crews going to the proper job and we're not sending full line crews to a circuit breaker uh, outage or, you know, or a petty man to a large tree that comes down. So we're looking at really um, pre-fielding jobs um, and also having someone to go out there to assess to bring that information back so we get a good message out um, to our and outage be more map. strategic. More strategic, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, it sounds like you have a lot of moving parts. Um, I do recall that when we first asked for this, Marty, you said we'd have it all stood up in 30 days. <laughs> I did, and uh, we, we do have our, our uh, emergency management folks that are actually uh, running emergency management and prepared to do that, um, uh, you know, when we have an incident. And so um, we are we are stood up to do that. We will continue to improve this, but we are, are much better resourced. So does that mean that there are like names assigned to all of these 
you know, we're going to do X, we're going to do Y. There's specific people mm -hmm. that know that this is going to be their job <laughs> and that, and there's some chain of command that activates those people, a criteria that determines when it's activated and a way for this all to connect in, supported by technology, a way for all, this to all connect in to a larger response uh, mechanism were we to be engaged in an emergency that affected not just us, but others. Yes, and I think that's a, a good point too, is having those trigger points uh, that are available. So um, in the past, we've always waited for the city to, to put together an, an ICS system, right, that we would respond to and we would participate in. Our internal has always been very small and very centric to, uh, say, the power system. Um, you know, moving forward, having that incident command um, centralized under Brian Lamb, uh, I think will help us all and it also get, you know, our water system, our joint system and everybody involved earlier in the process um, at the start of a storm or pre-storm uh, so we can prepare these much better. So it seems like Mr. Lamb should be presenting the plan. <laughs> <laughs> and you exercised this during the last last storm yeah. preparation, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. So we, did. I my, uh, we didn't wait for the next storm to happen. We actually led the efforts with Adam Perez and Aqueduct. So we brought together all divisions to have a wholesome planning. So in the past, I think it was in each system were in their own silos. And by integrating and bring all groups, customer service, uh, FSO for damage assessment and tracking, um, everyone can voice their opinions on what's working for them or any um, gaps that they have currently. So by bringing them all together, we have a wholesome planning and we didn't wait for the next storm. Actually, we did that for the aqueduct response and, and someone can chime in too if he wants. Uh, I think uh, they feel that support. The support is there, um, whether it's uh, resource requesting through uh, the county for extra support for crews um, or even going to working with Edith Williams and her team with purchasing and getting the items they need that is an emergency uh, procurement. Uh, and I think working. having it centralized is so important. Correct. So it it's, uh, seems like tag you're it. Yes. <laughs> Good. And, and not only that, I think the biggest component is the communication aspect, right? Uh, to inform our board, <coughs> to inform our executive management, to inform our city and county partners of what the situation awareness is. I think that's the biggest gap we have. And moving forward, we will work closely with our public information, with Joe Romalo's group, and all groups to understand that. So um, in closing, uh, my comments is on after action report, uh, we have identified and tasked each division to provide us the concerns and the gaps they felt during the emergency for this uh, storm. Uh, not only are we uh, identifying the gaps, but actually each director of each business group will actually identify who's the responsible point of contact within their group to actually um, focus and complete that task. We will also provide you with uh, metrics with the dates that will be completed. Um, so then that way, if we're not meeting those gaps, we can definitely reach back and follow up with these respective directors. Thank you, I appreciate that. The other thing that I would uh, like to see, and I, I assume that we do, but I've not heard about them, um, our drilling emergencies. We are going to, I suspect, be called into uh, into situations where we're going to have to respond on a more frequent basis, whether it's climate change or some other external factor. And of course, we live, you know, in the middle of earthquake country, so anything could happen. And I think that systems perform well, um, you know, emergency systems in particular, when they are when there is an actual coordinated simulated drilling. Um, otherwise, you, you know, they just sit on the shelf and, and we can get um, you know, a little complacent and a little uh, rusty when it comes to implementation. So um, I would be very interested in understanding what our um, plans are and you know, how frequently and what the results of drills are. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm not just draft the after action to draft it. I think in the past, many of our experiences, like someone drafted an after action report, you got these action items, but nothing was really followed up on it. So my commitment to you and for my team, Office of Emergency Management, we'll you know continue to provide these drills, uh, make sure everyone understands their roles and responsibilities, and bring in not only our internal stakeholders, but our county and city partners to uh, have a wholesome planning for us. Terrific, I appreciate it, thank you. Any questions? Sounds like we're headed in the right direction. Arm, did you have something? No, just uh, just to answer your mm -hmm. question, uh, President uh, McLean-Hill, 
the the action items are specific and deliverable i think what what's going to be measuring the effectiveness of that is we have to exercise those changes in the field before the next event mm -hmm. so i think we will be communicating to you as far as um, when that exercise is going to be performed because mm -hmm. a lot of these are process changes and we have to make sure that everything is in place before the next event mm -hmm. and that is the sign of how effective the after action is otherwise it's a waste of effort to identify something but not change the processes because everybody will default to what they're trained they on. did before <laughs> what they so used I think to that's the change management that we have to go through much appreciated thank you gentlemen um we can now move to item number nine on the agenda so i called item oh i'm sorry i jumped i need to do a couple of other things oh. before going there um yes yeah uh is there a motion to approve the minutes? So move. Second. Second. Commissioner Katz? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes motion adopted. All right, so uh, number nine. So I called item number nine special only because my name was listed in the body of the report. And I just wanted to clarify for the record that I was never involved in this particular contract or never bid on this contract, had never anything to do with it. So if I can just have uh, staff come up and indicate why I was listed. Sure. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, on the uh, contract selection uh, format for the board report, you're required to include the last 10 years of contracted services related to that type of service, not related to this particular contract. So because there was a history in the contract history for strategic planning services, um, that is why your firm's name was listed. Uh, it's not to indicate any involvement whatsoever in this particular uh, contract that's being awarded. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that for the record. All right, uh, then uh, do we have a motion to approve uh, item nine? Motion to approve item nine. Second. Commissioner Katz? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes, motion adopted. All right, uh, then if we could have uh, item 10, please. So uh, from our power engineer manager for distributed resources and development programs, uh, Arash Saidi. All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm Arash Saidi, power engineering manager for um, power planning. And joined to my right is George Chen, who's an executive of our financial services organization. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to mention one item. So the board uh, item link, which contained all the documentation, what inadvertently had one document that was um, uh, uploaded. So we've gone ahead and fixed that, and that was the actual agreement which makes this program effective. But as of today, it is, it is uh, all resolved. So we kind of step through this. Uh, the agenda is going to follow this format, which is we want to understand the overarching goals. What is the landscape for even bringing this program to the board? Um, the effective compensation structure that would make this program a viable option now and possibly into the future, uh, the overall budget, and then uh, our next steps and then the, and the benefits that we gain as, as a department from this knowledge that will be uh, extracted from these projects. So first and foremost, uh, Governor Newsom has issued uh, numerous letters to various uh, state and other bodies uh, to basically ex explain the de-energization issues within California. So to that end, it went even further that in 2021 and 2022, he issued st uh, proclamations of emergency as far as energy. And this basically asked to uh, deploy any and all resources to meet the electrical demand needs for the state of California. And where possible, we, DWP, we're, we made ourselves available for the state in order to, to meet the needs. Um, but going forward, we're going to have higher penetrations of renewables, and those, those issues are going to be plaguing us as we look into the uh, future. So we're getting ahead of that. And other goals that kind of line up with this are the Executive Directive 25, which basically goes from top to bottom of all city facilities of zero carbon, um, from the transportation sector, the building envelope, any and all aspects of city operation. Furthermore, LA Metro, LAUSD, who was just here moments ago, um, as well as long haul 
last mile delivery. They all have these decarbonization um, plans that have either bo have board approvals or in the midst of doing so. Um, another thing that's lining up perfectly is the Inflation Reduction Act, because as of right now, this Inflation Reduction Act provides um, heavy incentives to bring in prevailing wage labor to do this work and to, to basically bring dollars that are much needed to these projects into Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the CEC has uh, transportation investment uh, funds that have been unlocked, about $3 billion. And of course, the California state budget, which is still um, in the midst of being developed, will have carve-outs, uh, as we understand it, for, for EV, uh, especially on the commercial end. So I think it's important to know that in the draft SLTRP, uh, our modelers did a great job of coming up with uh, basically overarching goals and, and, and targets that we need to reach. On the high end, you have about 755 megawatts of energy storage that needs to be deployed just in Los Angeles. And then on the low end, 220 megawatts. Obviously, you know, my, my, my motto has always been uh, shoot for the stars and land on the moon. So I'm, I'm shooting for 755 here. Um, and one of the ways we're going to do that is by involving that public-private partnership that's worked very well within an example feed-in tariff where we've been able to deploy 102 megawatts of installed capacity and gaining steam. Um, this is another example, but we're going to take it a few steps ahead of that, learning all the technology improvements that we've, we've seen in other utilities and bring that within this program. So we, we also did some uh, landscape uh, exercise and understanding where does this market uh, stand? So PG&E has, um, in a way, kind of announced they uh, will be publishing an EV export rate, but nothing yet. Um, but ha having said that, we, we also want to be kind of at the forefront of, of this area because energy storage is the future, um, and it needs to be the, you know, assets that we deploy in, in its current state and learn from that technology to be able to monitor and control these assets at the grid level. And then we step down, Dominion Energy also has a similar program where they can call on these assets at any point in time. These are uh, up to 15-year agreements, and of course, they uh, take it a step further and they actually cover the, the battery warranty and what have you. So we took a mixture of these programs and others from National Grid and kind of brought this uh, to, to the table when we were in the process of developing ours. So the way we see it is energy storage to us it's irrelevant whether it's sitting on four wheels or it's sitting on a concrete pad. Ultimately, it's electrons. We need them, and we need them discharged during key hours. And that's really the intention behind this program, is that we're open to all sorts of technologies to be able to, to essentially send the market signal to both the developer side of it, to the customers who are participating, to the manufacturers who are building those chargers or those lithium ion cells that we need that here in Los Angeles and we want to use those IRA dollars to help subsidize those costs. So I'm going to pause here for a moment because this is probably some of the most important parts of this presentation. Like I said, stationary and non-stationary energy storage systems are, are eligible to participate in this program. Um, we've got 20 megawatts that we want to offer on day one um, through various tranche offerings. So what that means is that we would start off with four megawatts, ramp up to seven megawatts after that four megawatts has been um, subscribed to, and then eventually nine megawatts. Because I firmly believe that as we launch programs, there's lessons to be learned very quickly. And we may have to come back to this board and say, well, we made a mistake and we need to make sure those remaining megawatts need to be adjusted and the rate needs to be tweaked accordingly. But as of right now, that's the signal we're sending to the, to the industry. The third thing is uh, with the help of FSO and George and his team, we were able to develop this standard offer rate agreement. And if you have a chance to review that agreement, you'll notice it's very similar to an EV commercial EV rate program that was developed, but we've gone ahead and added a lot more color and flavor that allows us to, to extract the value we need. The third, or excuse me, fourth item is the interconnection reimbursements. Now, this is absolutely important, and I, the reason I bring this up, and this is the first, actually the second instance where we're doing this, the first was our feed, fit, feed and tariff plus pilot program. The reason we need this is because, first and foremost, there's a lot of costs associated with these projects. And sometimes 
um, when, you're, when you're doing a project and you have these investments, that upfront cost of being able to connect to our 34.5 system or a 4.8 requires line extensions, requires upgrades to services. So what we wanna do is effectively use our capital costs, our borrowing power to be able to subsidize that cost and then create an opportunity for these developers to really focus on getting their systems um, built in such a way where it doesn't provide financial burden and ultimately deploys more of these assets. That's really what we're trying to do. Now, moving forward, these are separately metered systems. And the intention there was not to co-mingle with the existing customer load. We want to track exactly what that energy storage system is doing. And that's why it's a kind of a separate carve out, separately metered uh, altogether. And the last item here is um, actually a recommendation that came from uh, various stakeholders, which was let's make sure that these contracts are good until the li useful life of the batteries. So not make them a standard 10, 15, or 20 that we've seen in the past. But if the battery manufacturer says it's only good for seven years because of the way you're gonna operate, well, that'll be it. You know, that's the way we're gonna do it. We're gonna do a seven year agreement that'll be uh, effectively aligned with the, uh, the useful life of that battery. So, um, like I said, there's three compensation mechanisms, and let's dive into a couple of these. So number one is the interconnection reimbursement. This is a one-time payment after the commercial operation date of the system. Um, the other thing is that we will we'll cover up to 75% of that cost, not to exceed 150,000 if connected to the 4.8 and 400,000 to the 34.5 system. The other most important aspect, I think, of this is the signal that we're sending to the market, which is the energy export rate. The way we've set it up is if they charge at the high peak and they discharge when we need it, um, the spread, so to say, the arbitrage play, is about 17 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, now, they can, of course, charge on more opportune hours, non-critical uh, peak periods in the late evening, early morning, and they can create a larger opportunity to gain. But as it stands right now, that's the energy export rate that can, they can pretty confidently uh, rely upon. Now the third aspect of this is, you know, it's, it's great to say we can provide this export rate, but if we don't give them predictability, uh, these, day, these deals become very unbankable, as they say, in the industry. And so the, the idea is when an underwriter is reviewing these projects, they need to know their certainty. They need to know that we're gonna be able to pay um, for the discharge energy. So what we're doing is basically saying that we're gonna guarantee 50 critical peaks. If, if we happen to only discharge 10 or 20, we're still gonna pay for those 50 critical peak events so that we have this resource available. Just like if we have a generation facility, it's, there's, there's maintenance costs, there's upkeep with that, we still have to pay for that. But in the event that we need to call upon that resource, um, we, can, we can depend on that. So, High level, we've got a program budget about $32 million. The uh, estimated, and again, I think this is more the worst case scenario with the reimbursements. We've estimated a maximum of six million. The board letter, I believe, says four and a half. That's probably more realistic. Um, the maximum energy credit paid to all participants is approximately 26 million. We estimate about $45 million in new energy sales. Now. This is one thing to, to keep in mind is a lot of these folks um, may or may not choose to, to uh, procure EV vehicles or energy storage systems, but what we're trying to do is send a signal to do this now and do it in such a way where it's beneficial to the grid and it's bi-directional. So we're basically saying, instead of spending, let's say $100,000 for a typical DC fast chargers, I want you to spend 120. Get, get me that DC fast charger and that, that can now inject energy back into the grid during those key peak hours. And again, that'll be at full discretion for our control center to do so. Last item here is the uh, net program revenue is uh, approximately $13 million. So I kind of alluded to a lot of these items, but I'm gonna really uh, hit on a couple of them. Number one is the dispatchability of energy. Um, at the ECC, we've done a lot of investment in IT, and especially on the uh, grid ops side. So uh, when it comes to distribution energy resource management system, this is the holy grail. This is the ability to control all of these solar energy storage, EV vehicles, all in one platform. And we want to have not only the visibility, but the ability to control that in a secure manner. In a secure manner. And I believe we can do that. So we've worked with various organizations within the department with it, within our energy control center to effectively adopt that method. And it's baked into these guidelines. 
The other thing that we're um, really excited about is the market benefit, right? So if we take a step back for a moment, um, I don't know if most of you know, but in 1999, DWP was the first to offer uh, solar incentives before it was popular. And I think part of the message we sent was we're here to say, we're here to be the number one solar city and we've achieved that. For I believe seven of the past eight years, we've ranked the, as the number one solar city in the country. I would like us to come back to board in the, in the coming years to say we're the number one commercial EV or energy storage provider um, for, for, for all, all, all cities in the country. So that's the message we wanna send with this program. And the last thing here is the environmental benefits. So it's, it's needless to say that, you know, obviously the, the transportation sector is the most polluting sector um, in, in our economy. Now, one of the things we can do is we can send the signals and market opportunities to adopt clean energy technologies. As an example, LAUSD approximately has about 100 um, diesel-fueled vehicles that there is, that's in their fleet. I would like those 100 to be the first to be participating in this program. I would like all the FedEx and UPS last mile delivery trucks to, uh, to integrate within this system. So we now have a breadth of different customers that are taking advantage of this program. So there's a lot, of, uh, lot to gain here. And locations, and I, I kind of thought ahead and I said, well, I'm sure the board's gonna ask me this question is, where are these projects gonna be located? <laughs> And how does that correlate with disadvantaged communities? So if you'll notice here, the shaded area in pink represents our quote unquote DAX or disadvantaged communities as defined by Senate Bill 535. Now, we, we wanted to make sure that when we develop a program, it's not just saying we'll try our best. And, and, and so with this, we, we went ahead and did, and we looked at where are these you know, schoolyards located, these bus yards, where are the, you know, housing the FedEx trucks and what have you. And it happened to just be perfectly correlated uh, with, with disadvantaged communities. So the, the great news is, is those areas that happen to have the highest uh, levels of, of pollution and toxins from the tailpipe will be the beneficiaries of, of this program. And we've gone to quite extensive lengths to make sure they know this program is in the process of coming. They're excited, they can't wait. And so um, that's why we're here today to, to basically more or less explain the urgency behind this um, and, and the great benefits that come with the, uh, the adoption of such a program. So uh, going ahead, we've got a, obviously a pending board approval. Um, late March, we'd like to uh, um, shuffle this over to the uh, ECCJNR uh, council committee meeting and then by early April, full council. And then eventually, if successful, launch this program. So before I end, um, I think it's most important that um, I extend the, the, the sincere gratitude uh, that's deserved to all the people that were involved. First and foremost, power system operations. Matthew Emerson was integral in making sure, first off, that this could be integrated with our energy control center. Uh, power New Business, led by Emil, Lynn Doan, May Sang, Luis Nunez Uribe. In IT, we were working very closely with Sherwin Chan. And in rates, um, starting from the top, Ann Santilli, George Chen, Dahlia Trad. Moving down, power system planning, Vin V and Samer were the integral folks who actually helped develop this program from the guidelines and from the application and just the overall process of understanding what a customer's touch points are with DWP. And then special thanks to the city attorney's office Bill Casella and Brian Stewart. They did a lot of heavy lifting, countless hours. I can't recall how many times Bill had to come back from, from his vacations to, to really uh, to, to, to make this happen. So uh, really special thanks to Bill. Um, and with that said, uh, I look forward to any of your comments and questions. You probably add um, customer service, they're being- Oh yes, I apologize. Customer service division was absolutely a, a major part of this uh, puzzle, um, so. Okay, good. All right, thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Um, Dr. Pickle. First and foremost, we, we thank them for engaging with us early to discuss this program, and our comments uh, reflect the benefit of that long engagement. Um, we recommend that the board approves this uh, program uh, as, as a pilot. Uh, and um, the utility industry has had three millennia of experience with storage, starting on the water side. 
Uh, but every kind of storage is different and has different commercial aspects and different technological aspects. And we're seeing a rapid change in storage technology right now and its costs. We're also seeing rapid innovation in commercial aspects. So we expect to see other pilots uh, creating innovation in addition, in addition to DWPs. So there's learning to be based to go on here. Um, you have my report. I'm not going to walk through all the key points unless you have questions. Uh, but um, we've tried to make sure that there is no commitment that's too long, longer than 10 years. Um, and that there's a diverse commitment for different kinds of projects so we get maximum learning out of this. Uh, that and the rules are going to change fast over the next 10 years. Um, thank you. Uh, I will just offer this observation. You talked about the solar program and DWP's uh, early adoption and um, significant commitment to becoming the number one solar system, in, uh, solar city uh, in the country. Um, what we don't talk about is the fact that that comes at a price, and it came at a price to our most disadvantaged customers. Um, and so, you know, I'm always going to be very concerned about how we deploy our transition into a, you know, a, our electrification transition. Um, you know, and I would also say that to the extent that you expect commissioners to vote on programs of this kind, that it would be wise to uh, engage with them early as well, um, because a you know, 15 minute presentation uh, of, you know, that has implications for so many things may not be enough to get people on board. And let me just say, may not be enough to get me on board. So I would take that um, note moving forward. Um, and I do have questions about the degree to which this particular work was daylighted in the context of our ongoing equity strategy study. Um, I'm always concerned about, uh, you know, sort of siloed efforts. And as we are building and, you know, seeking to fly the plane at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that the systems or that the mechanisms that we put in place to provide uh, rigorous evaluation and thought from a range of perspectives um, are, uh, are um, present as we roll out programs. Um, but my you know, overarching concern uh, goes to the degree to which um, we um, incentivize uh, new industries and private parties with public money uh, to create a certain set of objectives uh, without ensuring that um, those dollars are being, the impact of those dollars are being multiplied because the public that is paying um, isn't reaping the benefits always equally. And I can assess based on an overlay map whether that is the case here or not. Um, and so uh, I'm very reluctant, frankly, to move forward um, because there are things that I don't know that are extremely important to me. And you're going to either need to say more about that um, or you're going to need to come back. Yeah, let, let me just start, start off with this is part of a, a more holistic strategy. And, and when, I, when I say that is that we're looking at it from multiple fronts. There's a lot to gain because a lot of these folks um, will likely adopt EV vehicles or EV fleets. Um, but the thing is, in order to make sure this works, is that they need to adopt vehicles that are capable of bidirectional activity. In addition to that, they have to make sure the chargers are. So when all this investment is happening and they install the non-compliant versions of this, they're just going to exacerbate issues on the distribution grid. And we're not going to be able to deploy these assets in such a way that actually benefits the local grid. Now, if we look more closely, in the near future, our plan is to deploy 
um, programs that effectively get to the customer level, the, the residential level, where we can actually manage charging, send the proper signals that effectively say, this is the right time to charge, and this is the time to let your car stand, be on standby. But again, this is, again, part of a uh, you know, holistic approach where we're starting with, I think, the biggest users of energy and decarbonizing their transportation fleets in order to, to, to extract the largest gains. And the other point to this is that the, the gain that you get from actually integrating within our control system, that is immense. That ability to be able to dispatch these resources like we've seen in demand response. Last year, on a peak day, we were able to dispatch 82 megawatts. If we can bring another 20 megawatts into the fold, that's 100 megawatts that the ECC can push a button and be able to discharge that and not have to turn on one of our LMS 100s. And that's a valuable uh, resource that we can essentially de deploy on. Now, between now and 2035, we're gonna ramp that de demand response program up pretty aggressively, about 500 megawatts. That's basically one of our local generation plants. And again, this is all done through the, the uh, secure methods deployed through uh, uh, the, you know, the control of these assets. And, and I think one of the things that we have to take a step back is to learn from this type of stuff is that we have to make these investments. And I think that's what we're doing now. Um, so I don't know, if George, if you want I to may, add more to that? Um, yes. To address the president's <coughs> question and, and concerns on the impact to vulnerable communities and the equity piece. I was encouraged to see the LAUSD piece on there. I know that the replacement of diesel school buses will have, although this program is more focused on greenhouse gas emissions, there will be, you know, potentially significant reductions in harmful emissions um, with impact on our school children. Are these proposed areas, do they reflect organizational commitments? I know LAUSD was in the room earlier, but um, do we know what their commitment is and how many buses yeah. might be part of this program? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, there are four schoolyards within LADWP territory, um, of approximately 1,400 school buses, 100 of which are the diesels. So those will be the first that will be the adopters, a replacement, rather, um, of this strategy. The, the other thing is, in conjunction with that, we've been working very closely with LAUSD on DOE grant submittal. So we've, we're have encouraged, based off of a concept paper, to go further and submit a full proposal. And part of that was we actually called out this program and said, if you award us funds, we're going to take those funds and ensure that all dollars associated from the DOE grant go into disadvantaged communities. Not a portion, but every single last penny. And that's really what we want to do, is make sure that the burden that typically plagues most communities, most disadvantaged communities to adopt this type of technology happens to be these interconnection costs. And we want to just remove that off the table. And that's what effectively what those DOE dollars were due. Now, come this summer, Cal EPA is issuing further grants. And we're going to be applying for those. And again, we're not grant writers. But luckily, we've got an amazing staff of folks that are uh, on board who are helping us put together these grants so that we continuously get these uh, encouraged proposals and uh, hopefully uh, dollars to be awarded and again, to affect and impact these communities that are historically disadvantaged as a result of uh, Thank you. you. Know. And to the president's silo question, mm -hmm. are, is your team working with the LA 100 you know, equity strategies team and, and fitting this strategy within the broader strategy? That, that is, and, and just one thing to, to bear in is mind. Is that a yes? Sorry, yes, that, that is. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't there. Um, Sorry, yeah. if I can jump yeah. in. So, uh, Jason, Jason Rondo, director of re, uh, director of planning. Uh, <laughs> Today, <laughs> today. Yeah, so, I mean, I'll check my email. So maybe. <laughs> an hour. Um, so I, I just want to again thank Rush for him and uh, for him and his team and, and George Chen as well. Um, they've put in a massive amount of work on this. I just want to address the question uh, very directly with respect to coordinating with equity strategies. So um, that effort is ongoing. Um, we have had an internal uh, uh, meeting with all different uh, subject matter experts, sort of an internal change management effort. Uh, there was one of those meetings, I believe, at the end of uh, uh, December. Um, there was a significant participation internally. Uh, we've said that that's something that we need to continue even before the finalizing of that effort because we really need to start that change management now. 
Uh, we also uh, have been starting to scope out a series of customer workshops with a dual purpose of educating the customers on and educating uh, stakeholders as well on the significant investments that we have made to date on all types of programs. We ran into the, the awareness issue uh, this past fall when we were seeking su uh, support for Scattergood uh, modernization where there was a misperception that we are under investing in distributed resources. So we wanted to have a slate of customer program workshops with the dual purpose of awareness but also feedback on growing those programs. We know from the LA 100 effort and many other efforts that we're going to have to scale these programs up pretty significantly. So we worked with Joe Romalo and uh, Simon Zudu and determined we would like to do, do those right now, but we want to time those and work together with equity strategies to make sure that they're done in conjunction. So whether it's assessing a pilot program like this or looking back on existing programs that need to grow or potentially new programs, that's the form that we would like to do it uh, concurrently and within the framework of equity strategies. So I just wanted to, to, to clarify that, that we are absolutely working together. There's a lot of work to do uh, to, to make sure that the, we're extracting the full value from that engagement. We, we are absolutely working, at, working together there. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you. Can, can, if absolutely. I could add. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. May I add? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> one, uh, this uh, effort uh, estimates revenue of 45 million and costs of 32 million. Mm -hmm. So uh, that means there are net benefits flowing to other customers if it works as hoped. Exactly. M most, most importantly, this is a relatively modest pilot and we encourage pilots for the benefit of the innovation. Uh, and the, e even if everything goes wrong, the costs are thir 32 million uh, and that is uh, less than a half of a percent of DWP's total costs. So no, I, I I get all that, and I take your point. But I will tell you that I've sat in meetings in this department where you know thirty million <coughs> to support something that supports our least um, financially capable customers has been presented as a significant obstacle. So it just really depends on what side of the table you happen to be on. Sometimes it's all the money in the world and sometimes it's just a lint in our pocket. But but I'm, I am comfortable and happy to hear. Um, and as I said, um, it would be useful um, to flag these kinds of projects that are, um, I do know, important and I'm clear about how much support this has out there. Um, I just want to make sure that our commitment to moving forward all of these um, efforts in a way that is cognizant of the total interest of our communities mm -hmm. is consistent and is resolute. It just takes work. And I know that if we do the work that we can achieve it. So um, I appreciate the additional information. Again, I appreciate the clarification and the um, and um, I'm happy to move forward uh, unless there's uh, someone that has additional questions. No further questions, but I did just want to comment, having seen the early research side of this with our Smart Grid Energy Research Center and engineers at UCLA um, who were testing this concept of vehicle to grid integration many years ago. I know the long path that it has taken to get here. And I just want to say I'm really excited to see us actually being able to operationalize this concept that will be so transformative for the city. So thank you very much to your team for all of the hard work and thank you President McLean Hill for ensuring that it continues to be integrated with the equity strategies and focus on our vulnerable communities and I too very much support this uh, initiative. Was that a motion? Uh, sure, if you're comfortable. No questions. Okay, yes, motion to approve item number 10. Second. Uh, would you call the roll please? Commissioner Katz. Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes motion adopted. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes this agenda. I have a question to council. Uh, can we move into our second meeting, uh, the special meeting before going into closed session or do we have to go into closed session first? Yes, you can recess this meeting, go into your special meeting and come back to this meeting. Okay, terrific. Then um, we will current, we will recess uh, our, uh, our regular meeting um, and move to open our special meeting. Uh, with a single item on the agenda. Uh, so um, 
Board Secretary, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Katz. Uh, present. Commissioner Lair. President McLean Hill. Present. Commissioner Neiman Brady. Vice President Ruiz. Present. Three board members, a quorum is present. Madam President, may I open public comment at this time? Please do. Public comment is open. There are no public commenters. Public comment is now closed. Uh, are there any comments from the rate care advocate with respect to this item? For emergencies, I get out of the way. <laughs> 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 Terrific. Uh, any discussion with neighborhood council or any impact statements? None at this time. Uh, terrific. Then we will take up item um, E1 for approval. That item is in, uh, what is it? Uh, a resolution authorizing the general manager and chief engineer to implement the actions set forth in Mayor Karen Bass's emergency declaration from March 14th, 2023, pertaining to the Los Angeles aqueduct system. Are there any questions? Uh, first off, yeah, are there any questions or comments? Or do, and do we need a presentation on the item? No, I'm comfortable moving forward. All right. Uh, then it's been moved. Second. Uh, would you Commissioner please take the vote? Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Katz? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes motion adopted. Terrific. Thank you for that. And um, we do not have a closed session agenda for this particular board meeting. Is that correct? That is correct. Then um, this meeting stands, the special meeting stands adjourned, and we will resume our um, regular meeting. I'm sorry, uh, sir. I, I just want to uh, thank you publicly for, for moving so quickly to support the team and the staff because the phone call that you received from me was frantically trying to put this item on the agenda. And your, your, your answer to me was, was amazingly, um, it showed the support. It said, let me worry about the details. You worry about the operations. So I just want to bring that up in public and thank you for... Uh, a great leadership that uh, you showed. Thank you. No, not, not a problem. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, we are now back in our regular meeting. Do we need to take the roll? Um, I, I think we do. Yes. Would you please take the roll? Commissioner Katz? Present. President McLean Hill? Uh, present. Vice President Ruiz? Present. Three board members, a quorum is present. Terrific. And we will now recess into closed session. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we can just stay in this room for closed session if that's okay. Um, uh, I guess we have the magic words from general counsel. Board shall recess in closed session after the to consider the items that are listed under um, item N of the uh, agenda. After the closed session, the board will publicly report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention thereon of every member present in accordance with California Government Code Section 54957.1. Terrific. Uh, we need Reggie to get us off the mic. 